The reason why there is no written literature on exceptions is very simple. I may be the first person in the 20th century to figure it out. And I haven't written the book yet. Um, this doctrine was very widespread in medieval astrology. They just never bothered to define it. They assumed you knew. And I had to dig through book after book until I found the definitions. They were there. They were just in books that nobody had translated yet. The best definition I have ever found is in an English translation of Abu Mashar's Lesser Introduction, which is not readily available because it's published by a very hard to find academic press. However, Project Hindsight will be republishing the translation within the next year. In that book is the clearest and simplest definition of reception I found anywhere. And it's pretty much as I've described it to you. Bonani uses it all the time. But the definition is buried in the middle of the third book. Now, there are nine books in Bonati, totaling about a thousand pages of small print Latin. Now, as you may have noticed, when you translate English into Spanish, the text increases by about 50%. When you translate Latin into English, it doubles. The final translation of Bonati we expect to be about 2,000 pages. So buried in the middle of that somewhere is this definition of reception. A reception is the only thing you will not find discussed in any of these books yet. But I do have about a two-thirds complete short work on dignities and reception as they were used in the ages. And I don't know when I'm going to finish it. It depends on how much time I manage to create. So, just to get back to the question for a moment. Dignity strengthens a single planet planet that is dignified. Reception joins two planets in a relationship and also strengthens one of the planets and strengthens the other. Now I have to tell you something very curious about this. If I take Bonatti literally, kind of reception you have with the Sun and Aquarius and Saturn and Leo is not only useless, it's devastating and terrible. Because Bonatti seems to be saying that in a reception, whatever dignity or debility the receiver has is transferred to the received. So if you have the sun in Aquarius in its detriment at Peregrine, it starts out at minus 10. If you have Saturn in Aquarius in Leo in detriment and Peregrine, it starts out as minus 10. And they then give their minus 10s to each other. So they now have minus 20 each. Now, I don't think that's actually correct. But that seems to be what Bonatti thought. I would prefer to leave it that the reception doesn't work. Because I don't know what I would do with a minus 20 essential ability. <laughs> what do you say to somebody? Your son doesn't work. Uh, <laughs> So that, that's, that, I hope that is reasonably clear. I'll probably say more about it today or not. Can I hope? Okay. Uh, I
I said yesterday I would start off this morning in honor of it being the uh, day of the sun, also known as the Lord's Day. The only question is which Lord are you talking about? Uh, by talking a little bit about esoteric astrology as it survives from the ancients. I actually already have talked a little bit about it when I talked about faith yesterday. Because that material is part of ancient esoteric astrology. By the way, the nice thing about this material is it's not technical. Except, of course, for our old friend the Chaldean Order. This doctrine, by the way, survives in modern-day Sufism, the one I'm about to show you. It's a little transformed in its nature, but it's still there. The soul, it was believed, comes from the realm of the stars. And for one reason or another, the soul decides to incarnate, or somebody decides that the soul is going to incarnate. Now, I'll start with the optimistic view. The optimistic view is the soul decides to incarnate. And at this point, the doctor begins to sound decidedly Hindu, but there's a major difference. In Hinduism, the soul incarnates in order, in order to realize the consequences of previous actions. It's a law of cause and effect. The word karma actually is Sanskrit for action. That's all. All this unbelievable load of stuff we've dumped on karma obscures the simplicity of the idea. But the Western view is a little different. The Western view will sound very familiar because most people don't realize that what they think is the Eastern view is actually the Western view. The soul has a desire nature. A desire nature born out of its incomplete self-realization. And it looks down at the world and at some moment it sees in the world something that arouses its desire nature. And it chooses that moment to incarnate. This answers the question about free will perfectly. You don't get to choose, you already have. Now, the lower type of soul will incarnate out of sheer willful desire. The higher level soul will incarnate out of a need to perform a conscious task. Now this is the optimistic viewpoint. The pessimistic viewpoint states that you had no say in the matter at all, and in fact, you are grabbed out of the universal fiery spirit and thrown into this mess by a malignant egotistical deity who simply wanted to populate his mess with souls. This is Gnosticism, the last view. The previous view was Hermeticism. I'll tell you the story, the Gnostic story is, is very strange. And I think deserves the distinction of being one of the most screwed up metaphysical systems ever to conquer. My viewpoint is very much anti-Gnostic in this respect. I have to explain something about the word Gnostic. All it means is one who knows, as opposed to one who believes. I have no problem with that idea at all. But the problem is really about a particular kind of Gnosticism. 
that sprung up in the early centuries AD. The main problem I have with this Gnosticism is that it regarded the physical universe as evil. Not merely difficult, evil. And here is the here is a sort of composite of the story they told. According to the gloomier Gnostics, the universe was originally created entire and perfect by a wholly benign deity realizing itself. No problem. This deity proceeded to produce out of itself a series of lesser manifestations of itself. Finally culminating or anti-culminating and here the story gets a little vague. In either a pair of a pair of manifestations known as faith and wisdom or just wisdom the version I prefer, because it's clearer, is that there were two of them, faith and wisdom. Interesting enough, wisdom was female and, and faith was male. Sophia. And Sophia, for one reason or another, decided to create yet another realm without the, or yet another God, I should say, yet another level of God, without the assistance of faith. And she produced an entity uh, who went by various names according to whichever system you follow. But this entity was rather demented. It's usually called Yaldabaoth. Yaldabaoth, these Gnostics believe, was the god of the Old Testament. And he, seeing the beautiful universe that had been created, decided he could do just as well. But he couldn't. The only thing he had available to create a universe out of was his own exploit. So he proceeded to create a dull, dead parody of the light world out of his own excrement. And then he noticed quite correctly that it was dull and dead. So he rose up to the cosmic fire, stole sparks of fire from it, and hurled them into his excrement. That's us. And according to this rather gloomy story, finally the creator, the original God who created everything, realized this had happened and sent the Christ into the world to redeem the sparks. This is not Orthodox Christianity. Well, the point here is that most of the ancients agreed on one thing. The physical universe was not the place to be. They, uh, some of them thought it was basically good but not too high. Other ones thought it was a sign of the evil. But there was, a, there was a group of followers of Neoplatonism who came to a rather radical different they concluded that the physical universe was in fact the highest and most perfect expression of divinity and that it was simply our ignorance that prevented us from knowing this strangely enough there was at least one group of Christians that agreed Uh, these Christians wrote a gospel called the Gospel of Thomas. 
and it is now believed that the Gospel of Thomas is probably older than the Gospel of John, and nearly as old as Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Maybe as old. It's just sayings. There's no history. In it. And in the Gospel of Thomas is a rather interesting variation of the well-known line, the kingdom of God is within you. It goes like this. Jesus said, you have heard the kingdom of heaven is in the sky. I tell you that if the kingdom of heaven is in the sky, the birds of the air will get there before you. You have heard it said that the kingdom of heaven is in the sea. And I tell you that if the kingdom of heaven is in the sea, the fish of the sea will get there before you. But I tell you that the kingdom of heaven is within you, among you, and around you. And when you know yourselves, you will be known. In other words, this is it. There is no place to go. But there's a lot to be learned. How many of you, when you had a child, those of you who had children, especially the women, because you were, you were obviously there when it happened. The men may not have been. How many of you actually thought of that act as an act of ensouling matter? In other words, that was a moment in which you were working to assist matter in becoming self-conscious by creating yet another being. What we, intend, what we tend to do instead is to think, how am I going to pay for this? How am I going to send this kid to college? Who pays the doctor bills? Where are we going to put him in the house? See, this is the way in which you don't see the kingdom of God. This is precisely the way in which you don't see it. Just this sort of getting bound up in the garbage now, let me back up and bring the astrology into this. What I haven't told you is about Yaldabaoth's original sin. Not human, Yaldabaoth. Yaldabaoth was actually identified by the Gnostics as being the lord of the seventh planetary sphere, specifically. Or putting it another way, they said the God of the Old Testament was Saturn. And Yahweh said to his new creation, I am the Lord thy God that hath created thee, thou shalt have no other gods before me. In other words, there is no reality higher than the narrow reality given to you by this level of understanding. Now this idea appears to have been fairly widespread because a, a Syrian astrologer who wrote in Greek a Venus Valence about 175 AD states in his first book that Saturn rules the principle of ignorance. What is it you are ignorant of under Saturn? The higher aspect of reality. See, Yaldabaoth wanted to make sure that his sparks of light stayed in the dung heap. Now, I don't regard the physical universe as a dung heap, but I can easily see how one could see it that way in a state of Saturnine ignorance. Now, basically what happened was, according to these people, when you incarnated, the first thing that happened was you hit the sphere of Saturn. And in the sphere of Saturn, you were told to forget about the higher reality. This is it. Physical reality is all there is. 
that Jupiter you got desire for worldly power and in Mars you got a you, you got the will to fight and, and create strife at the Sun you got pride and arrogance at Venus you acquired lust this is not a very positive view of the planets. I will admit that. At Mercury, you got the ability to be tricky. And at the moon, you got a physical body. And you became subject to growth and decay. Now there are some rather interesting points on route here. You notice the moon's position is rather important. It, it rules the actual act of incarnation. The ancient astrologers regarded the moon as the most important of all planets. The sun was important, but it was rather distant. The moon was right here. The moon is the ruler of the act of incarnation. Consequently, one of the first things you did when reading a chart is exactly what modern people do when they do horror. What is the last aspect of Moon made? And what will be the next aspect of Moon made? Because that indicates where in the flow of destiny you are born. If any aspect in your chart of the moon that is separated, and by the way, there's no or, whatever the last aspect was, no matter how far back you have to go to find it, is the condition that was passing away when you were born. The next aspect the moon will make, no matter what the or, is what is coming to be <coughs> with one small or one big reservation. If the moon has to change signs before that next aspect, this creates a problem. You've all heard of this, the void of course moon. Anybody not heard of the void of course moon? Very popular these days. Whole regiments of astrologers go into paralysis when the moon goes away, of course. Well, we've been surprised to discover that the void of course moon was very prominent in natal astrology. And the delineations are just horrible. You will be poverty stricken, an orphan, a wanderer, and your life will have no meaning. We'll be Anybody got a void of course moon in the natal chart? Oh come on, there's gotta be somebody. My god, either either nobody's confessing or this is a remarkable room. Uh, you see, void of course moons are quite common in natal charts. And I have never met one who fit the description that I just gave. However, I have found out, I believe, what it means. Because the moon rules the tide of fortune, when the moon is void of course, there is no current. This means, in fact, that the person has a harder time figuring out what to do with their life. They don't have a clear direction. Now, if you go back to that ancient delineation I gave you, you will see that that's merely an extreme form of what I just described. A wanderer, a beggar, a person with no money, no direction, their life is meaningless. That's simply an extreme void of course form. <coughs> Oddly enough, a couple of very famous people have had them. I don't know how well Malcolm X is known now major leader of the blacks in the 50s and 60s, until he was 
assassinated. Actually, I still say 60. Um, he had a boy in course. Sure enough, he was an orphan. Sure enough, he, wa he, he was a wanderer most of his life. Sure enough, he had no money. But interestingly enough, when he became a Muslim, his life began to work. So you see, the void of course boom is not hopeless. But it does mean you've got to work a bit more than other people. This is true of all void of course planets and what they do. Now the big problem the ancients had was Having come down through these seven planetary spheres and having become subject to their faith, what do I do? The Stoics said, nothing. You liberate your mind and you resign your body to faith. This is not too satisfying. The Jews said, no problem if you're Jewish. <laughs> Yahweh liberates you from the faith spheres. Which is very strange considering everybody else thought Yahweh is who put us here in the first place. A difference of opinion, clearly. Uh, the Christians said, if you are not a Christian, you are subject to the fates. If you are a Christian, you're free. They did address this issue directly. Except Jesus and the planets have no effect. This has not been my observation. The Neoplatonists implicitly gave a rather different answer. I happen to think this is the proper answer. There is no problem at all. In fact, this is the answer, this is a variation on the answer I gave you from Thomas. The problem is that you are not conscious of what you are doing. There's this section of material in Plotinus, the greatest Neoplatonist, where he talks about proper seeing. The Greek word is theoria, from which comes our word theory. The word theoria in Greek means nothing like modern theory. Although I can see how it came about that way. Theoria is a perfect seeing where there is no where there's nothing at all between you and what you see. Now you may ask, what, what is this like? You do it all the time. When you walk up and down the street, do you think, now I pick up my left foot, now I pick up my right foot? Actually, if you thought that, you'd fall on your face. Now I pick up my left foot, now I put down my left foot. Now I pick up my right foot. Now I put down my right foot. Do any of you do that? I hope not. I'm doing a little bit today with this cane. But, uh, uh, today the cane has interrupted my theoria of walking. Any task you, you perfectly master is an example of theoria. When you no longer do the task, you are the task. The challenge that the Highness gives us implicitly is to learn to do this with the chart. See, what we do in astrology, perfectly understandably, is we look at the chart and say, what does this Saturn in the 10th house mean? We don't tend to look at it and try to experience it as being in us and to feel it until we become totally at one with it. Experiential astrologers are working along these lines, but I don't think they have the right techniques. A person
person who perfectly saw his or her tenth house Saturn would simply flow out of that tenth house Saturn. It might still be difficult, but it would be totally conscious. So the object of astrology, according to the Neoplatonists, would be to render the chart completely unnecessary. Because you know, you see, you feel exactly what you are, and you do it consciously. But the kind of consciousness that you have when you walk, not the kind of consciousness you have when you try to figure things out. Interestingly enough, in the Corpus Hermeticum, which is the major work of Hermeticism, when a person dies, and I think they're talking about an enlightened person, they are said to ascend back through the spheres. At the moon, they give up being subject to growth and decay. At Mercury, they give up trickery. <coughs> At Venus, they give up lust. At the Sun, they give up pride. At Mars, they give up rashness and aggression. At Jupiter, they give up greed for wealth. And at Saturn, they give up delusion. And we think of Neptune as delusion, not Saturn. But I have long been saying, this is probably our hands, the most famous aphorism, Saturn is the, is the illusion that there is a reality. And Neptune is the truth that there isn't. See, the illusion of Saturn is that there is nothing higher than this. It is Saturn that gets you caught up in the day-to-day -day garbage so that you can't be conscious any longer. It's Saturn that makes, makes you think that paying your electric bill is more important than becoming conscious. Now, I agree, if you're starving to death, food is definitely the first thing you have to deal with. If you don't have a home, having a home is the first thing you have to deal with. No question. But I don't think most of us have problems with those things. Yet we still don't seem to quite get it that we're supposed to go beyond the day-to-day -day issues of reality. Even science tells us there is no higher reality. In fact, science is the most Saturnine discipline ever to hit the human race. Now, some scientists have transcended this. I'm talking about normal science. The phrase that uh, one translator gave for the Saturn thing is surrendering the illusion that it snares. Now, Saturn is perfectly benefic when you use it to deal with ordinary reality and you keep it in its place. Remember yesterday how I said that Saturn must be limited? When you don't allow Saturn to be limited, it takes over your life. So does Jupiter. So does the Sun. Okay. So, they saw enlightenment as a process of ascending through the spheres. And this doctrine also survives in Hebrew Kabbalah, only it's a little more elaborate. And if you ever study schools like the Golden Dawn or any other modern esoteric school, you will discover sitting there waiting for you in slightly altered form the doctrine of the ascent of the spheres. Now I'm going to show you something very interesting. The normal pattern of the Chaldean order is to count, as I showed you yesterday, Saturn, Jupiter, Mars, Sun, Venus, Mercury, Moon. What I call the descending order. The descending order I call 
incarnational.
Yesterday, we looked at a time for Carlos Salinas. And I have since been told there is some controversy about his birth time. So without taking the size, let's look at the other time. Which is uh, 11 p.m. rather than 9 and something. Capricorn, 12th degree of Capricorn. 
Bar is uh, it's about again. Uh, Saturn is domicile. Mars is exaltation. Octagonal chart. Moon is triplicity ruler. And twelfth degree. Uh, Mercury is bound lord. And Mars is face lord. Mars and Saturn are tied. Because Mars gets one for face and four for exaltation. Tying Saturn's five. So Mars and Saturn can be both viewed as our mutants of the second house. Uh, <laughs> and they are conjunct. One of them is strong, the other one is weak. Which tells me that his financial fortunes would have serious ups and downs. Um, that sometimes he would be wealthy, other times he would not be wealthy at all, or he would be subject to some kind of constraint. It also suggests that the source of his income would be from foreign countries. And whose pay was this man anyway? But again, we don't know, we, you know, I'm not taking sides here, I don't know which chart's right. But this would definitely not be something that would come to him freely or easily. Any other aspects to that? I won't play with that on today. Yeah, the sun trining, the sun trines that uh, Mars Saturn conjunction, so that helps, uh, especially because the sun Mars trine involves receptions all over the place. Mars is in Leo, and the sun is in Aries, so it is a, and and the sun is also exalted in Aries, so the sun receives Mars by domicile, the sun receives itself by exaltation. In other words, the sun is dignified. And Mars uh, receives the sun by domicile. So that's a pretty strong configuration. I think it would probably go a long way to clearing up the difficulties created by the Saturn. I should have said that yesterday also, because it's true of both charts. Um, when you have a thing like this Moon, Mars, Saturn, Pluto opposition, trying and sexting by a dignified planet, it takes a lot of difficulty away. Trying sextals to oppositions stabilize oppositions phenomenally well. I don't think he could have ever attained power without that trying. I would still say this is a man who would stop with nothing to get ahead but he wouldn't get ahead. The other kind, it, without that trying, he probably, somebody probably would have gotten him before he got somebody else. Note, by the way, that we have two dignified planets, the Sun and Jupiter. Okay, third house. The third house is clearly in trouble because the moon occupies the third house and is afflicted by Saturn. You say, ah, Saturn is receiving the moon, right? No, Saturn is in detriment. Saturn cannot be seen when it is in Leo. So the moon-Saturn opposition is not improved. Or if we take Bonatti, the moon goes from zero to minus 10. I'll just say it's not improved. So this moon-Saturn opposition, uh, is definitely problematic. The sun sextiling it from the near the cusp of the fifth is a help, but not a total, not a total cleanup. It's a help because any dignified planet will improve the condition of any planet in aspects. Any dignified planet will improve the condition of a planet in aspects, even if it doesn't receive it. There's only one problem here. The sun cannot, cannot help a planet in Aquarius very much. Why can't the sun help a planet in Aquarius? Think of the logic. Because the sun would be a detriment in Aquarius. Yes, you're getting it. You're getting it. Very logical. It's incredibly logical. Don't worry, it isn't always logical. 
There's a lot of traditional astrology you just have to take on faith after you discover that it works. So the sun sexual moon helps, but not very much. So the net result of all of this is you have an afflicted light in the third house opposed by a detrimented ruler sexual by, the, by a planet that cannot help anything in Aquarius. In other words, the third house is a source of trouble. And what does the third house rule? Yeah. Or in this case, it could be sisters, but uh, it's as a woman. Brothers will be. Is, uh, is his brother younger? Older. Older. Ah, that changes the equation a bit. Some more and more. The third house is the general house of siblings. But if you want specifically an older sibling, you go to the 11th. Older siblings are the 11th. Because you are the sibling of that person. What house, of what house is the first house, the third house? Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, the 11th house. The ascendant is the third house from the 11th. So you are that person's younger sibling. So we go up there, and we go, is it Neptune 14? 11, okay, I can't read it clearly. Okay, uh, it's not terribly close to the cusp, so we'll go right to the, we'll go right to um, a Libra. Nocturnal chart, we can safely say the 11th house is ruled by Venus. Venus is in the sixth. Now, that's not a particularly good place for Venus. Venus is in Taurus, which is a own sign, but it is conjunct malefic fixed stars, the Pleiades. This means that whatever is ruled by Venus can be subject to injuries, accidents, blows, and blindness. So this reinforces the information we're getting from the third house. You would use the third house as well. It's not the 11th instead of the 3rd, it's the 11th with the 3rd. Now, just to make things even more interesting, Mars is the general significator of siblings. In all ancient astrology, Mars is the general significator of siblings, just as Venus is a general significator of love, no matter where you put it. And you wonder why brothers and sisters fight. So where is Mars? Mars is opposing the moon of the third house. So I would say the 11th house doesn't change things very much in the way we read it. Um, this chart, I must admit, does, does show clearly the difficulty that is currently going on. Um, but that in itself is not proof. How would I distinguish between these two charts if I were going to do so? I would do it with events. I would do it with events. Or, as they put it, you would rectify the chart according to the accidents of the native. It's having a big one at the moment. Um, let's take a look at that. Um, there's not much going on with the moon, with the, with the opposition itself. Saturn is near his sun. Um, but that isn't too relevant to the third house. What other transits have we got here? Uh, Uranus is an early fixed. He has nothing in early fixed. Pluto is an early mutables. Let me just take a quick look at the other chart here. Yeah, that's not too potent, though. Progressions and directions might. Uh, 
I will say, however, that uh, when Uranus gets to the middle of Aquarius, uh, this gentleman is in for a difficult time. Because Uranus will then set off the Moon, Mars, Saturn, Pluto complex. Yes? What about when next year there's like to be in Aquarius? That sounds like he may actually uh, have a bit of assistance. Uh, yeah. Uh, I, based on this chart, we cannot assume that his brother is going to be convicted. It's going to be what? It's going to be what? Can he leave jail when Jupiter comes up the moon? Oh, you mean his brother? Yes. Could his brother leave jail when Jupiter conjuncts the moon? And the answer is possibly yes. Possibly yes. It may not be permanent, however. You really, you really would want to use the brother's chart. <laughs> it's far away the better tool. Okay. Um, let's continue on to the houses. We go to the fourth house, and therein lies Mercury in Pisces. And as we know, Mercury in Pisces is not a very happy Mercury. However, the ruler is Jupiter, and well, maybe, well, the A ruler is Jupiter. Let's find out if Jupiter is the only ruler. We have the 18th degree of Pisces. Jupiter is domicile. Venus is exaltation. Nighttime chart well, doesn't matter. Mars is complicity. Mercury is in its own bounds. So this is not quite your worst possible case, Mercury in Pisces because Mercury is not peregrine. So you give back five points, and being in its own bound, you give it seven points, you give it two points, plus, by the way, you don't give it five points for not being peregrine. You don't take away five points, you hear the difference. So Mercury has two points plus, and nine points minus, so it's minus seven. It's still not great. Error, error, backwards longitude. That's 2207, not 722. Sorry, let's do that again. We're looking at the 23rd degree of Pisces. I'm sorry. Mars. Mars, yeah. It, this is a totally peregrine Mercury. Therefore, we are dealing with a minus 14. Yeah. Mars will help you. Mars face, Mars bomb, Mars duplicity. Yes, Mars is the help you. The albutin of the fourth is Mars. Oh, no, the albutin of Mercury is Mars. Actually, the albutin of Mercury is Mars. Um, the albutin of the ascendant. Uh, I see, rather. <coughs> see how confused I can get today. Uh, is Jupiter. So Jupiter is the albutin of the IC, who. I don't think they have a dead spot. They have a All right. I hope I'm not blowing your eardrums out when I do that. Good. <laughs> okay, so the Almutant of the fourth house is Jupiter. The, the dispositor of Mercury is Mars. And they are both have Jupiter as domicile. So Jupiter is a fair place to look. So even though there is something funny going on about his home and family life and his, pro and his real estate, it's basically okay. What does he do? Own a lot of property near swamps? Or the water? The waterfront actually would do it. Yeah. So he owns a lot of waterfront property? He owns a lot. Okay. He owns a lot. Does he own a lot of bulldozers? I know. Another one. Yeah. When you have a water sign on the IC, You apparently bought a whole new section of Oxford Holco. There's your Pisces. See, water signs on the IC indicate you live in, you like to live in places that are wet, foggy, or near the sea. He lives in Ireland right now? Oh, he's really bad. There's no country on earth more than more Piscean than Ireland. He'll be very happy there, I'm sure. <laughs> El asunto de la 
de la sirvienta que encontraron él y su hermano cuando tenía cuatro años. Él tenía cuatro y el hermano tenía diez. That's especially enlightening view of the Mars side of Pluto conjunction opposite the moon. Yes. Uh, yes, Luis just pointed out, and I was just noticing also. Let's boogie on over to the sixth house for a moment. This is a nocturnal chart. Remember what I told you about Taurus at night? The moon is the albutin of Taurus at night. The sixth house rules serving persons, maids, and such like. Now, there's an interesting thing here. Um, in medieval astrology, they made distinctions. Serves, serves, yes, slaves and servants who did not have anything to do with the household were sixth house. Household retainers, persons who worked for you but were free, were second house. Familiars, they were called. Domesticos, I guess. Um, I haven't actually, I don't know if that distinction still works. The practice in later astrology is to make the sixth house all serving persons. And now, of course, it's the house of employees. Uh, but given that, I would say that shows it fairly well. Okay. Uh, we have the, we have Aries on the cusp of the fifth. Definitely ruled by Mars because it's a nighttime chart. Although the sun is nearby. An exalted sun. Um, what, uh, tell me about the children. Three, three children. Uh, how does he get along with his children? Anyone know? Okay, because that's a little problematic with Mars being up there with all that stuff. Yeah, the sun and Aries must be clearing it up. However, let me tell you this. Um, with the sun in Aries very close to the cusp of the fifth, and having dignity in Aries, the sign of the fifth, this is good for sons. The chart's not so good for daughters. Um, but, because the ruler, the ruler by domicile and the albutin, is afflicted, this means that his relationship with his sons may deteriorate over time. <coughs> That it will that the older they get, the more difficult his relationship with them will get. So you can make a predictive statement based on the rulers versus the planets in the house. So that he would have sons is indicated by the exalted sun near the fifth cusp. In English, of course, sun means male child and celestial body, but the spelling is different. Sol, what's the singular for sun in Spanish? Eco, okay. Eco versus Sol? Yeah. Sol. Strangely enough, the Scandinavian word for Sun is Sol also. I like, I like the Southern German language. Okay, so uh, one could reasonably predict, as I stated, that the that his relationship with the Sun would deteriorate somewhat over age, uh, over time, but because the Sun is trining the Mars, Saturn, Pluto, probably never told them. Uh, if you put that Mars, Saturn, Pluto in the fifth house, you almost certainly would never have had children, or he, or he would wish he never had children. Okay, the sixth house, ruled by Venus, uh, the moon. Or the, sun. the moon is the albutin of the sixth. Venus is domicile ruler of the sixth. Uh, the moon is rather badly afflicted. He would be well advised to go with Venus, although the Venus has no problems. General principle. According to Bonatti, I believe this is true. According to Bonatti, use the albutin of a house cusp only if the albutin is in reasonably decent shape. If the albutin is badly debilitated, don't use it. Use the domicile ruler. What happens if the domicile ruler is badly debilitated? Well, Bonatti says, go down through the five rulers until you find one that's okay. 
I don't like that. I would say stop with the domicile ruler. Let's say the domicile ruler and the albutin are tied, as we've seen already happen. That means you have two different paths you can take. And I usually recommend you go with the one that has good condition. Unless you enjoy suffering. I offer my own charts as an example. Mars and Saturn are tied for first as rulers of my seven. And um, Mars is in Scorpio, its own domicile, trying Jupiter in Cancer, its exaltation, whereas Saturn is peregrine, retrograde, and opposes my sun. Now I think we can clearly see here that I'd be far better off going with Mars than Saturn. Well, for the last almost 20 years I've been living with a triple Capricorn in whose chart Mars was the most dignified planet, but not the most powerful. That relationship at the moment appears to be ending. And another person has come into my life who has Mars on the ascendant. Now I don't know if it's, I don't know if I'm doing the right thing or not. Time will tell. <laughs> Let's just say I'm experimenting with my chart and let's go with that. <laughs> I'm happy to say that Mars in this case is fairly, is fairly well off. Okay, so he, his six house planets are by and large not very good. Uh, Venus is in domicile, but I don't like to be conjunct a malevolent fixed star. Please. By the way, the general principle about fixed stars when do you use fixed stars? Well, the bright fixed stars should always be used, mostly by conjunction, if real close, by opposition. But fixed stars become more important when the person has social prominence. The more famous, the more well-known, and the more powerful a person is, the more important the fixed stars become. In fact, powerful fixed stars in a chart are one of the more reliable indicators that a person will become famous or eminent. You can take a fairly mediocre chart, put some bright fixed stars in prominent places, and have a person who becomes famous anyway. Although, if the chart is not a strong chart, they will regret it. The fixed stars are all kind of crazy. They tend to make people rise to great heights and then fall. I don't recommend that people who have prominent fixed stars try too hard to become powerful unless they enjoy the opposite experience as well. But it sometimes works quite well. Winston Churchill, another one of my favorite case studies, had Regulus on his moon and Aldebaran on his sun. These are both called royal stars. Antares, sorry. Antares on his sun. Yes, we got the wrong one. Antares and Aldebaran are exactly opposite, so it's easy to interchange them. And Winston Churchill became one of the youngest ministers in English history, fell from power in disgrace, gradually rose to power again. His government was voted out of office. He then was regarded as an elderly has-been. Then World War II began, he was called back to the ministry, became prime minister, and at the height of his power in 1945, was voted out of office.
again, he was considered to be an elderly has-been. <coughs> then in 52, he was voted back in. And finally, he retired voluntarily a few years later. In other words, he had four major life beats and four falls from power. So, it's like a roller coaster with the fixed stars. If the current chart we have of Princess Diana is correct, and there's a lot of debate about that, she has Spica, the brightest star of Virgo, on the mid <coughs> Spica. Um, English has funny vowels. Um, this is one of the few fixed stars that is mostly benefic. And it indicates wealth, fame, and social eminence. Usually through Venus matters. matters. Okay. Now we come to Gemini on the seventh. Gemini on the seventh is definitely and positively ruled by Mercury and Pisces. Is this bad? Yes and no. It's not great for marriage, but it's wonderful for enemies. He has weak enemies. Because the ruler of enemies is debilitated. Mercury and Pisces, the bottom of the chart. Some of his enemies, by the way, may be from families that have long opposed his own, from his past, because Mercury is in the fourth. Now he's got Uranus in the seventh also, and that speaks about some instability in his marriage life. And it could also mean his enemies occasionally just burst out of nowhere and upset his life. <coughs> Uh, a few words about Uranus in the South. I'm sure some of you have it. By the way, is it my imagination or is the divorce rate in this country at least as high as it is in the United States? Very high, yeah. Uh, I, suspect it, I suspect it depends on the class. Um, okay. Uranus in the seventh does not mean that you are doomed to have a divorce. It does not mean you are doomed, if, you call it, if doomed is the right word, fated, shall we say, to have multiple relationships. But it does mean you'd better plan on having a lot of freedom in marital type relationships. I don't mean necessarily separate bedrooms, but there should be, uh, you and your partner should allow each other a lot of room to do your own thing. Otherwise, if you try to have a traditional style, very close, intimate, interdependent marriage, you probably will have trouble. It means make your, make your marriage your own style, or else. Eight counts. Ruled by the, uh, no. Ruled by the moon as domicile ruler, but it's in that bottom of cancer, which is ruled by Jupiter. So Jupiter and Moon share rulership over the air. Good thing, too. If that Moon were the ruler of his eighth alone, it would guarantee him a very difficult death. Because the Moon is afflicted. Jupiter in the first, ruling the eighth. Actually, that's a little strange also. When the Lord of the eighth is in the first, the native tends to be the cause of his own death. Not suicide. Can you repeat it? Yes, when the ruler of the eighth is in the first, the native tends to be the cause of his or her own death. This is also true when the ruler of the first is in the eighth. And it's really even more powerful if the ruler of the eighth is in the first and the ruler of the first is in the eighth. Now when I say
say the native has to be the cause of his or her own death, I do not necessarily or even probably mean suicide. More likely it's a lifestyle or the native initiates a chain of events that causes his or her own death. Lifestyle actually is the most common way it works. Like somebody eating and drinking too much or in the wrong way. So it doesn't mean you're going to slip your wrists if you have this. But it does mean you should look very carefully at the way you live and see if there are any self-destructive patterns and try to minimize those. So it's not, not doomed by any means. However, if Jupiter is the D, the ruler of his age, his death will be easy. If the moon is, his death won't be easy. Nice contradiction. The ninth house. Well, we can certainly agree that the cusp is not in good shape. It's ruled by the sun. The sun is in good shape. And receives the conjunction, which it finds. I would like to know about his foreign policy, but I'm getting now is not so much that he had difficulties with it, as that he was more than a little ruthless in executing it. Oh, so he was the one who pushed for an opera. Yeah. You know the definition of a compromise? A compromise is a situation where everybody loses. <laughs> the impression I have about an opera down here is that it's just about as popular as it is out north, which is to say, not very. Everybody seems to be very good at seeing the ways in which it isn't working. Okay. Yes, back there. But still, he, he has a lot of uh, friends, really friends. Uh, you know, uh, uh, he made good friends with Clinton and yes. with some other. So, so he has powerful friends who are foreign. Yes, he has a, uh, yes. That fits. Yeah, powerful friends who are foreign. Who are this? Could it also mean that Jupiter is the former of the eight house that he could like to some country? Okay, the question is. Uh, if Jupiter is the co-ruler of the eighth, could he die out of his own country? Right, Jupiter and Sagittarius. Uh, possibly yes. Uh, I will say possibly yes could mean that. A stronger indication would be if the ruler of the eighth or the ninth. Now, but I, but you you raise an issue which I like to deal with a bit. Uh, small side trip. Uh, modern astrology tends to equate the signs and the houses. So the Sagittarius is the ninth sign, is like the ninth house. Well, in actual fact, that that relationship isn't too inappropriate. <coughs> Sagittarius is rather like a ninth house. But any medieval astrologer hearing that Mars is like Aries, is like the first house, would probably have run out of the room screaming. Um, I strongly recommend, as a general principle, you not treat the signs and houses as being the same. Uh, in fact, later this afternoon, when we get into the lots, you'll discover just how unrelated they are, or rather how different they are. In fact, it may be there's no such thing as a house. There are only 12 functions of the signs of the <coughs> And any one of the signs is equally happy being any one of the 12 functions. Maybe. Okay. Let's just deal quickly with the time remaining. Virgo on the custom, uh, on the midheaven. And the fact that the ruler is in Pisces, debilitated and opposing the tent, is a good, strong indication that he would eventually have a fall from power. That's not good for holding on to power ruler of the tent in the fourth debility. Uh, Venus on the 11th, I commented on that about brothers. Um, as far as friends are concerned, um, the ruler, one ruler is in the third, opposing Mars, Saturn, and Pluto. Oh no, I'm sorry, I'm reading the wrong place. Uh, Venus is the only ruler of that house. 
Venus is in the sixth. Uh, Venus is dignified, but in a difficult house, and can jump the Pleiades, so his friends are problematical. Some of them are dangerous, some of them will be helpful, and they tend to be people who work for him. The twelfth house is ruled by Mars, absolutely positively, and Mars is conducted Saturn opposing the moon. Uh, Mars is powerful. His open enemies are weak, but his secret ones are powerful as hell. His secret ones are really dangerous. See how I got that? Ruler of the seventh debilitated, ruler of the twelfth dignified, and well aspected by its order. Mars isn't dignified by itself. Its dignity comes from the reception. There we go again. The mutual reception. Okay, I think that takes care of our second round of Carlos Salinas. Uh, after lunch, we'll take a brief tour, uh, tour of the chart of Zadia, which I mysteriously appeared during the night. Question? Yeah. Mars doesn't receive Saturn. Can you receive in a conjunction? Because it's Mars. Mars can't receive because Mars isn't in, Saturn is not in a position of Mars. Saturn is not in a house or position ruled by Mars. See, a receiver cannot receive by virtue of its being received. It can receive if it... By that mutual reception, it doesn't make it possible. No. Also, by the way, unless Mars and Saturn are in trine or sextile, they cannot receive each other at all. Now, this is something I haven't mentioned. Mars and Saturn cannot receive by square or opposition or conjunction. They hate each other too much. This is something you find all through the old books. It's an exception. Okay, short for the hour of mid morning. Oh, the next second. Question. One more question. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, does Jupiter on the cusp of the eighth always mean an easy death, or just in this case because it's <coughs> Jupiter is in very good shape? Okay, the question is Does Jupiter ruling the eighth always mean an easy death? Uh, all things being equal, it helps. The fact that it's dignified, it helps even more. Yeah, it, it, it tend, or of course, it can also mean death by lung disease um, or some kind of or liver disease. You mean that also. But then you'd want Jupiter to be afflicted or debilitated. And it isn't. Okay, mid morning. For uh, astrolabe software, we make astrological computing software that we think is very decent. Actually, we think it's better than anybody else's. That's all right. um, and I'll read you the address in case my handwriting is a problem. Astrolabe, that's an E on the end there, software, P.O. Box 1750, Brewster, M.A. from Massachusetts, 02, ugh, that's wrong, it's not 02653, sorry about that. That's my home, zip code. <laughs> O two six three one. Close but not quite. Fax five zero eight six five two eight nine. Voice five zero eight eight nine six five zero eight one. Our web page is http. I don't know if colon actually belongs there. But I may have the I may have the punctuation of this web page wrong, but it's standard punctuation. Uh, alabe.com, that's what you need to know. A L A B E dot C O M. The rest of it is just standard web page stuff. If you don't know what that means, I'm not gonna be able to tell you here. Project Hindsight, where the translations are being done. B.O. Box 002. Berkeley Springs, West Virginia, WV 25411. Voice and fax, but mostly voice. 304 258 5873. And our webpage is projhind.com. P R O J H I N D.com. Preceded by the usual garbage. So if you have a computer and you're on the internet, 
you can look at the web pages and you can also send us email through those web pages. And you'll get Madeline Hillis if you, if you contact Roger, uh, Good. Um, Robert Spiller, Ellen Black, if you contact, contact Project Hindsight. If you want me, call the voice. Okay. Let me know when you got that and I'll, uh, people got that who wanted? Can I take it off? Okay, I'll wait a moment. Uh, which one? Oh, 5873. 258 5873. That's why I read it. My handwriting is going to time with the keyboard. My handwriting is getting more illiterate the older I get. Because of computers.
So the reception is not useful. There's a very elaborate doctrine in Arabic astrology, which I have not begun to master, about friends and enemies among planets. All I can tell you is that Mars and Saturn are ultimate enemies. Think about it in a moment. Mars just wants to sort of blow up all over the place, and Saturn wants to keep the lid on. Pressure cooker without a safety valve. I don't know if that translates too well in Spanish. Boiling without a safety valve, that's better. Uh, I don't know if they were ever popular in this country, but about 40 or 50 years ago, in the States, people started using what are called pressure cookers. A big pot with a heavy steel top that, you, that gets clamped on or held on by a kind of screw-like motion. Yeah. Oh, you have, that's right, you, would, you know why? I, I wasn't thinking, you have to use the gear, you know why? The altitude. Mm -hmm. okay. You're far enough up so the water boils at a rather low temperature. Yeah, okay. And the what? The beans. The beans. Yes. The beans require extra heavy boiling. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, at any rate, a lot of them didn't have very good safety valves, they used to blow up. That's Mars Saturn. And before it blows up, of course, you have people who are very intense and sort of frustrated. So, what else is going on here? Um, moon is separating from a sextile Saturn, but it can't do much for Saturn either. We have Jupiter, what appears to be five degrees. I uh, can't tell for sure exactly what it is, it's hard to read. Um, that's a wide opposition. And we have Uranus and Cancer squaring Saturn, not from the house of open enemies. Let me put it this way. I would prefer not to be a president of this chart. I don't see him as a danger to Mexico, but I would say his position of power is not at all secure. Uh, this is this Saturn on the midheaven, squared by Uranus, is an example of what is called the Napoleonic aspect. There's only one problem. Napoleon didn't have it. <laughs> His great nephew, Louis Napoleon, Napoleon III, who uh, he of evil memory in this country, the guy who financed the Emperor Maximilian. Remember him? At least from your history books. Uh, he did have it. It was actually, it is a Napoleonic aspect, but it was Louis Napoleon who had it, not, not the great Napoleon. So, uh, Zadio has got the Napoleonic aspect. Um, so, it is a strong indication of a sudden and rather graceless fall from power. Zadio. I checked it out once. I gathered several dozen charts that had it, and I gathered them in a way that I didn't know who they were. did was I had these collections of charts where the positions were all given in the back of the book without the data. They were only numbered. And so I took out all the charts that had this configuration. And of all the people that I was able to identify, some of them I had no idea who they were when I found out, um, overwhelmingly they had the experience of some fall from great power. Uh, were I his astrologer, I would have said, do not try to rise too high because the fall will be very unpleasant. So I'd say he has a very strong indication of a sudden and graceless fall from power. Um, it could be just being voted out of office, but it's usually a little more graceless than that. But one of America's presidents, Herbert Hoover, was simply voted out of power with enormous enthusiasm. In other words, he didn't just lose, he lost catastrophically. That could be characteristic here also. Actually, the worst thing about this Saturn is the square from Uranus in the house of open enemies and opponents. So, we, if we want to continue analyzing this, why, why don't we just continue flowing with this? Well, since we're looking at the seventh house of open enemies and opponents, don't we want to look at the moon? Because the moon 
is the ruler. The moon is in the twelfth. I don't think he knows who his enemies are. His open enemies are at least initially secret. These charts are amazing. They're really good for demonstrating. Politicians are wonderful. They lead the kind of lives that medieval astrologers would have studied. The ordinary people didn't get their charts cast in the old days. Your average peasant didn't even know a day he was born. And he couldn't afford the fee. So medieval astrologers tended to write about people who were powerful and rich, who had led glamorous and sometimes catastrophic lives. So modern politicians are the nearest equivalent. Okay, continuing. So the moon is in the twelfth, and the lord of the twelfth is Jupiter, and Jupiter is in the third house, fairly near the fourth house cusp. Uh, that doesn't really tell us much. Some of his secret enemies are weak because, because we have a debilitated Mercury, but the moon isn't terribly weak. Uh, intriguingly enough, the moon is in a spectacle to Neptune. If I were just simply reading this abstractly, and that's basically what I am doing, I would have to say that his secret enemies are assisted by persons he knows professionally in the oil industry. Neptune. Neptune is chemicals, oil, and things like that. You could also give Pluto to oil if you like. And of course, Neptune, oh God, him and Clinton. Uh, Neptune is conjunct Mars and Libra. Yes, it could also, yes, thank you, it could also be the drug industry. Yes, absolutely. What an interesting chart. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> moving, to the, moving to the second house is also ruled by Saturn. So, since Saturn is exalted, it means his income is uh, basically fairly sound, but because of the square from Uranus, again, subject to unpredictable ups and downs. If I were he, I would have a large Swiss bank account. Or better yet, a Cayman Island Swiss bank account. If the Swiss are getting honest. Yes, okay. okay. Third house is ruled by Jupiter. Jupiter is in the third house, but in the next sign. Uh, I see, okay, Jupiter is square the sun. That's five, I can see it now, it's 531. Jupiter squares the sun. Uh, sun rules, but Jupiter rules the fifth, the third. But it says something about his brothers, but nothing terribly bad. Uh, does he have any brothers and sisters? He does, okay. Are they at all prominent in his life? or? Okay, so we'll just pass by that. Fourth house is ruled by Mars, because it's a nocturnal chart. Mars is in Libra in its detriment, conjunct Saturn in its exaltation, <coughs> conjunct Neptune in Libra. Uh, um, I, if I were he, I don't think I would want to live near a sea, because with Mars conjunct Neptune, it would wash away his house. Um, What is his background? His family, heredity, stuff like that. Is his family been lower middle class? Okay, that's what it's doing. Okay, so he's risen up from the he's risen up from lower relatively lower classes. Yeah, mostly one. Ah, according to according to CIA, he may have, he was adopted. What?
That's very good symbolism for the Mars, Neptune, and Libra of the Saturn nearby. Let me talk a little bit about the fourth house of parents. I am happy to say we have found out the facts, historically. I am sure you have all heard at one time or another the great debate, which parent belongs in which house? I am here to tell you the answer is that they both belong in the fourth. There is a passage in Ptolemy that was mistranslated into Latin and modern languages, which implied the mother, mother, excuse me, the mother was in the tent. But the actual passage says, not that the tent house is the house of the mother, but that we should look at the tent house from the moon, which signifies the mother. The moon that signifies the mother, not the tent house. This passage was mistranslated. Later, the Arabs used the tenth house for the mother for a different reason. The Arabs are among the most patriarchal people on the planet. Women are of little or no consequence in the Arab world, except I'm sure within the family itself. So the mother was viewed as the father's wife. Seventh from the fourth is the tenth. So if you are looking at the mother as the father's wife, then yes, of course she's in the tent. But most people do not experience their mothers as being primarily their father's wife. Now a stepmother would definitely be the tent. A stepmother would definitely be the tent. No argument. Because that person is your father's wife. A stepfather would also be the tenth, because he is your mother's husband. The complete doctrine on parents works like this. The fourth house rules all persons from whom you are descended, including your mother and father. They don't even do this business of making the fourth house from the fourth house be grandparents. The grandparents are also fourth house. Great grandparents are fourth house. Your entire heredity is your fourth house. Because that's what the fourth house means. I just want to let you know, however, that if you pick up a medieval textbook, astrology, it will say the tenth house of the mother. But we now know that they had it wrong too. It was a misunderstanding of the Greek doctrine. Now, can the tenth house be the mother? Certainly. For the reasons I've stated. The tenth house can also be the father. For the reasons I've stated. However, the Greeks gave the fourth house to both parents. <coughs> then they did something else. This is Ptolemy's doctrine, but you'll find it in other writers as well, even ones who do not depend on Ptolemy. If you are born in the daytime, we'll go here. If you are born in the daytime, use the sun sign as the first house for the father. And all the other signs are counted as houses for the father. So if you have Venus, well that won't work. If you have uh, Jupiter four signs away from the sun, that means in your chart, Jupiter is in the fourth house of the father. Now, a question that may be running through your mind at this point is, where are the cusps in this house system? And the answer is, the signs are the cusps. The sign of the sun, the whole sign, is the how first house of the father. For persons born during the daytime. 
Now you would look to see what which one of your ascendant houses the sun was in, also. For example, my sun is in my regular sixth. This implies that there is something cadent about my father. My father had a fairly poor health. But if I'm going to evaluate my relationship to my father out of my chart, well, I won't actually have born at night again. Scratch that. Um, if I were born in the daytime, I would take the houses from the sun. If you're born at night, you take the houses as signs from Saturn. Now, most of you have probably heard that the sun is connected with fathers by day and Saturn by night, or some of you have. But what you probably didn't know is that Ptolemy and the others actually intended you to erect houses from these points. This did not become clear until our new translation. Although we suspected it a long time ago because of other astrologers of the same period. We've translated half of Ptolemy now. And uh, I can say this with all humility because I didn't do the translation. It is the first reasonably clear and accurate translation of Ptolemy into English because our texts were better. And the last translation made into English was made by an academic who didn't care. And it's very inaccurate. The previous English translations were made from bad texts. Okay, for the mother. The sign of Venus by day and the sign of the moon by night treated in exactly the same way as I just described for the father. All signs from Venus, all signs from the moon. And I will conclude by getting a little ahead of myself. The next thing they would do is calculate the part or lot of the mother and the part or lot of the father and direct houses from those also. That's actually the most effective of all. I'll show you how to do that this afternoon. That stuff is incredibly effective. Okay. So the fourth house, according to the Greeks, is both parents. Hindus, by the way, give the fourth house to the mother, and the ninth to the father. And the reason for this is, in Brahmin families, the father, as head of the household, is also the priest and guru and the ninth house. Okay. Fifth house is Taurus. This is a nocturnal chart. Therefore, the moon is our mutant. Remember, the moon is exaltation and simplicity ruler of Taurus. And the moon we know is in the twelfth. Oh, good. Let's look at Venus, too, however. That thing up there in Scorpio. Okay. The blob of the other house <laughs> is, the, is Venus. 22 Tor Scorpio 36. Venus is in detriment. I would go with the moon, frankly. We have a 12th house moon versus Venus in detriment. Anybody know anything about his children? How many? Five. Five. Well, how does he get along? Yeah. Okay, is he a source of difficulty for his father? Yeah. He's having trouble with one of them. Okay, that's what I'd expect. Uh, if the ruler of the fifth is in the twelfth, I would expect the children to be a source of difficulty. Not that he wouldn't have them. Contrary wise, in fact, having Taurus on the cusp of the fifth, he's very likely to have them. But the ruler is in the twelfth, and the other one is a debt his children will be a source of difficulty. Wait, what are they? <laughs> I mean more than average. Okay. Sixth house of 
servants, employees, and servitude and health, uh, illness is Mercury. Mercury is in the 12th in Sagittarius. This is not a very good sign. Uh, he would find employees and people he hired working against him secretly. Yeah, well, they're not exactly his employees. Uh, they would be more like 11,000. Uh, Health-wise, he is in danger from the lungs or nervous ailments. I don't know anything about his health. He's young enough, so it may not be manifested. What? Actually, because of Mercury and Sag. Uh, Gemini rules the lungs, yes, but Jupiter signs also have Jupiter. Jupiter has connection with the lungs as well. So all of that equals lungs. Definitely Gemini is part of this. Nerves comes from Mercury. Okay. The moon rules the, se the seventh house and is in the twelfth. So his open enemies are assisted by a secret one, or vice versa. Open enemies are assisted by secret ones, or secret enemies are assisted by open ones. We have Uranus in the seventh, I've already talked about that. Eighth house is ruled by the sun. The sun is in Capricorn, square Jupiter. That would also speak of lung diseases as being the cause of death because of Jupiter. And Jupiter, <coughs> being near the fourth, is connected to the end of life. If I were he, I wouldn't smoke. Uh, but again, probably a swift and easy death. Robert? Yes. Can you tell something about his wife? I talk about the eighth now. The, uh, I didn't actually mention the seventh house and his wife. Let's go back. Uh, he has Uranus in the seventh, of course. Seems to be a custom among presidents these days. Uh, what's his marriage like? He's what? Oh, he's an alcoholic. Ruler of the seventh and twelfth. Not bad. That's actually even better for the ruler of the seventh and the twelfth and the open enemies assisting the secret ones. Although both are possible. Yes. She didn't want him to be president. I can believe that. Yes, she was happy to be him to be a secretary of state, but not a president because she's afraid that he might beat her. Okay, she's. Yeah. That's a realistic belief. Yeah, okay, this is making a lot of sense. Um, actually, I would favor the symbolism relating to his wife rather than enemies for the simple reason the moon is the ruling planet. And that's women. Uh, just out of curiosity, are the, um, insofar as Mexican politics breaks down along sexual lines, um, do men or women more favor him? Or does nobody pay for me? Okay, women don't don't make much of it. That okay, see, that's women as open enemies. Are by degree, 
not by men. I'm not sure of this yet, but it's worth it. It seems to be what the Greeks are telling us. And of course, the fact that they're telling us this doesn't make it so. <coughs> Just because the ancients tell us something doesn't make it true. We just want to study their material so we can find out if it's true. But they merely saying so doesn't make it true. Okay. Ninth house. Ruled by Mercury. In detriment in the twelfth. Um, any mitigation? Not that she's all essential yeah. to the uh, of Mars. The realistic belief. Or Neptune. Yeah, okay, this is making a lot of sense. Um, actually, I would favor the symbolism relating to his wife rather than enemies for the simple reason the moon is the ruling planet. And that's women. Uh, just out of curiosity, are the, uh, insofar as Mexican politics breaks down along sexual lines, uh, do men or women more favor him being in office? Or does nobody favor him being in office? Okay, women don't, don't think much of it. That, okay, see, that's women as open enemies. Saturn, 
Saturday Night Exaltation is the only decent thing about this combination. Oh, it's 
constructive arm and look at the chart when that sort of thing happens. Unfortunately, it requires rebooting the computer.
a very little bit. The author is Johannes Scherner of Nuremberg, Germany, who was a very well-connected man. He was one of the people who first had published the works of the great German astronomer Reggio Montanus, who did not author the house system, but he popularized it. As a matter of fact, they never called the Reggio Montana system the Reggio Montana system. They called it the rational system. It wasn't until later that people called it the Reggio Montana system. It isn't a Reggio Montana system. He just used it. The Scherner uh, first had his works published so they could be accessible to the learned of Europe. And comparing You've all heard of Copernicus, who came up with the theory that we revolve around the sun. Well, a couple of decades before Copernicus published the major work, a young Swiss heard about Copernicus's work. His name was Redicus. Redicus went to Poland, or what is now Poland, visited Copernicus, and asked Copernicus if he could write for Copernicus, a short work describing the heliocentric system. And Copernicus agreed. And Redicus wrote a book called Narratio Prima, the first narration, or the first telling. He wrote it as a letter written to Scherner. Scherner was the first astrologer to know of Copernicus's work. So he was a very well-educated man, very highly placed, one of the intellectual leaders of 16th century Germany. The introduction to this text was written by a theologian named Philip Melanchthon, who was Luther's right-hand man in the German Reformation. You get the picture? He was very well-connected. This was not your average modern astrologer struggling to make a living doing something that is mildly disreputable. That's astrology around 1540. This astrology is incredibly elaborate. Very little of the Greek material, but all manner of techniques from the Arabs. Nothing in this book is simple. This astrology is as complicated as anything from India. By 1700, this astrology was gone. And the reasons are not the ones you read about in the books. Let me say that even in the 16th century, astrology was controversial. <coughs> the reason why Malenkhan wrote the introduction was to defend astrology as being a legitimate Christian activity. Malenkhan, it turns out, was actually a fairly weird Christian. Uh, he is the source of some of the more interesting variety of German mysticism. But at the time, he was in power. Later on, he wasn't. Uh, astrology began to decline in part because of the rise of science, but in even greater part because astrology had a defect which astrology shares with psychology, sociology, economics, and all other social sciences, which is the experts didn't agree on anything. Have you ever, I don't know if you do this in this country, but you probably do, but in the States, if the defense is trying to get a murderer off because he's insane, they will hire a psychiatrist as an expert witness to show that the, that the defendant was out of his mind. The state will hire another psychiatrist to prove the contrary. Now, can you imagine defense hiring a physicist to prove one point of view, and 
the state hiring another physicist to prove a contrary point of view of basic physics? Of course not. I, I tell you that if, if sociology and psychology and economics existed in the 16th century, they would have died too. Because people wanted sciences that were absolutely definite. Particularly, the kings wanted them. They didn't want people using science to justify opposition to the king. Now, in Europe, this was a minor problem. In England, in the 17th century, it was a major problem. Because you had most of the astrologers forecasting the coming destruction of King Charles I. And they were right. What they didn't see was that King Charles II would come with the problem. So, astrology had a problem of not being definite. It had another problem, too. It had a spiritual dimension which allowed people to determine the will of God without a priest. And this, of course, violated the monopoly of all of the churches. So astrology gradually became, to put it politely, unfashionable among academics. This process began in the late 1500s after Scherner, and by 1700 was virtually complete. Now, there's, a, there's an image I like to use to describe the history of astrology. Ancient astrology was a vast reservoir of ideas and methods. A very large water main went to India. We got a garden hose. I'm about to describe to you who the nozzle was. In the 1600s, the only country where astrology was widely and popularly practiced was England. In the early 16th century, also France. But by the end of the 16th century, by the end of the 1600s, rather, by the end of the 1600s, astrology was dead in France. But in England, in the mid 17th century, astrology was a big business. And the astrologers were quite good at what they did. The greatest of them was William Lilly. William Lilly's astrology is definitely related to Sherman's. A little simpler, a little less complicated, because Lilly did charts at the rate of a couple of dozen a day, mostly questions. He also made a good living. Scherner was an aristocratic type of astrologer who would do two or three astrologer charts a year. He, had, he had, would only have a few clients. And he would throw everything he could at those charts. He only had two or three clients, but he had them every day. Because he was the astrologer for the aristocrats in Nuremberg. He probably had more than three or four. But it wasn't like Lily. Cardanus or Cardano once said that the reason why he made an erroneous forecast for a nobleman was the nobleman had given him only two weeks in which to prepare the chart. Two weeks? I think most of us could prepare a chart in two weeks. Not this way you could. And not by hand especially by hand. So the astrology of this period had gotten extremely elaborate. And frankly, we are going to have to simplify it. You have no idea how much more complicated it is than what I've shown you. And a lot of it is not very good, which is nice. We can get rid of it. But by Lily's time, astrology was still a fairly complicated and elaborate art, but learnable. Uh, there are probably several dozen people alive today who can do horary as well as and in the manner of William Lilly. And they all learn from reading William Lilly. A William Lilly style astrology is very popular among English speaking people now, both in England and the United States, Canada, Australia. Uh, I mentioned to some of you Lee Lehman. She has a very good correspondence course. We take it by mail in Lily-style horary. I'll get.
get her address out later. She's very bright, and she also incorporates a lot of the ancient material as well. And that's what I like about her course. She teaches you not only Lily, but the medievals and the Greeks. Although, order it. Don't go to her for natal astrology. Go to her, go to her for order it. Um, okay. Lily was an astrologer during the English Civil War when King Charles I lost his head. And he was a Puritan. He was on the other side. When the royal family came back to power, the astrologers were not popular because they were mostly on the other side. And the astrologers always argued among themselves, and that created an additional problems. Finally, to make a long story short, by the end of the century, there was only one major English astrologer left, and his name was John Partridge. John Partridge started out doing astrology like Lily, but Partridge was not a very good astrologer. He didn't understand a lot of the traditional techniques. And because there was nobody around to tell him he was being an idiot, he threw them out. Partridge was responsible for destroying about 75% of medieval astrology, single-handedly, because he was the last one. The next major astrologers in English history all learned through Partridge. By the way, Partridge did something else, too. He was the one who introduced classes into the English world. And after him, everybody did classes. The next great astrologer, astrologers, were the Sibley brothers, who were in the late 18th century. They tried to do a good job, but they basically had already lost the tradition. Then in the 19th century, we have Raphael Wan, who was basically a merchant, who sold charts along with magical charms, amulets, and stuff like that. And he was a very, very, very bad astrologer. I read his stuff and I weep. He is so bad. And he was the major conduit through which astrology became revived in 19th century England. And while there do, does appear to have been a continuing tradition in France, it was the English <coughs> that gave rise to the rebirth of astrology, and subsequently has stimulated the French tradition. Now a few words about the French tradition or order. The last great French astrologer, of the mid-17th century was Jean-Baptiste Morin, or Morinus in Latin. Marinus, actually. He was the astrologer <coughs> who was physically present watching the stars when Louis XIV was being born. He was in the room because he worked for Cardinal Richelieu. And he was very well connected. And he, but he was he, he decided astrology needed to be revised. And he wrote this rather large tome called the Astrologia Gallica, or French Astrology, in which he set forth his reforms. They're intelligent reforms, no question, but they're very untraditional. So even the French tradition is actually quite different from the medieval, because it's almost entirely through Marinus with the Thomas. So, how did the rebirth occur? I mean, the, the rebirth of the tradition. When Neptune entered Sagittarius in the 1980s, excuse me, entered Capricorn in the 1980s, people suddenly started reading William Lilly. They did this because of a woman named Olivia Barclay, who really studied William Lilly carefully. And she pretty much single-handedly began the rebirth of traditional astrology in the English world. We Americans decided not to be outdone. We said, why stop at the 17th century? Why not go back to 200 BC? And that's Project Hindsight. But the 
basic problem is that as astrology began to decline, fewer and fewer people had control over what would be transmitted. Until finally, one person in the English-speaking world determined what would be transmitted to posterity. Then, in the early 1900s, a second gentleman revised all of this to make it easy for hobbyists. And this was Alan Leo. What most Americans and British call traditional astrology was invented around 1910 by Alan Leo. It isn't traditional at all. So that's how astrology came to be where it is today, at least in the English-speaking world. Now I gather here, the French tradition is stronger. Um, and I just want to let you know that that's a better tradition, but it still isn't as good as the medieval. So, the medieval is coming. And uh, as I say, I don't, know, I don't know their names or addresses, but I do know that there are people in Spain who are translating the Latin works into Spanish. And I, as soon as I can find out who they are, I'll let you know. Because you'd really be much better reading in Spanish than English, I suspect. I would like to see their translations myself because we might be able to compare notes. <coughs> okay. Where are we now? We're shooting for 1.30? Okay. <coughs> Time for some lots.
occasionally through other lots. Now, the lot of fortune, also known as part of fortune, is usually given with this formula here. Fortuna equals ascendant plus moon minus sun. Now, this has been the source of some controversy of late because uh, we have discovered that overwhelmingly the ancients changed that formula at night. I used to say only one ancient didn't, but we now have another one who didn't too. A minority position among the ancients was that the part of fortune had the same formula in day charts and night charts. The majority position is that they did not have the same formula at night. So let me redo this formula. I'll turn this around in a moment. Fortuna by day equals ascendant plus moon minus sun. Fortuna by night equals ascendant plus sun minus moon. And by the way,
He reported back to me some months later. They were all in the night. Every chart where the part of Gorge failed to give the correct answer were charts cast for the night time. And of course, he was looking at the part of spirit. Therefore, I will insist very strongly that you use the night formula for night charts. That's secret number one. All of you who are born at night, who have your lot of fortune computed by most computer programs, have the wrong lot of fortune. Um, I believe, I, I don't believe, uh, solar fire allows you to choose whether you want the nocturnal formula used or not. So you can choose. <coughs> okay. Now, having found the lot of fortune, what do you do with it? Well, lots. Again, I would have handed this out to you all, and I'll leave a copy to you at the least. This is a handout I use for the Greek lots. I'll read you some quotations. This is from Paulus Alexandrinus, late 4th century AD. Oh, back up a moment, stop. How long have lots been in use? As long as they were casting charts. They are as old and as fundamental as the signs of the zodiac, the aspect of the planets. They are not Arab. The Arabs simply extended their use to an enormous degree. And in my humble opinion, nearly followed it up beyond redemption. You've heard the English expression, maybe snafu? Snafu is no military expression. I will give you the polite version. Situation normal, all followed up. You can figure out what really goes in place of foul. Well, there's an even worse one, FUBAR, F-U-B-A-R, which is followed up beyond all redemption. The Arabs nearly did FUBAR to the parts. Okay. The reason is, the Arabs thought the parts were simply points like planets. And they they take a lot of fortune, calculate its dignities, they look at its aspects, and based on that they would say what the person's fortune was like. The Greek practice was much more sophisticated and required many fewer lots. The Greeks would take the lot, call its sign the first house, and calculate signs as houses from that lot. Just like we do with derived houses, like we want to look at the mother's brother, we go from the third to the fourth, the mother's mother, we go the fourth from the fourth, uh, the mother's illness is from the sixth to the fourth, or maybe from the tenth. Same thing, only they do it with the lot establishing the first house. The other major thing, as I've already intimated, is the house system is all sign. Zero degrees of the sign is the beginning of the house, and 30 degrees of the sign is the end of the house regardless of where in the house the lot falls, where in the sign the lot falls. It doesn't matter. What's slightly scarier is they did this with the ascendant also. And whatever the merits of modern house division it may be, they appear to all be the consequences of the misreading of a single word in Ptolemy. A single word of two or three letters. If it's two letters, you get one reading. If it's three letters, you get the other reading. Ptolemy has been entirely too influential and entirely too unclear. Stick with whatever house system you like. But when you do lot houses, do them all sign. Okay. From Paulus Alexandrinus. And fortune signifies everything that concerns the body, 
and what one does through the course of life. It becomes indicative of possessions, reputation, and privilege. Very simply put, the lot of fortune is about prosperity. Just what it sounds like. A little further. Actually, no, this is Vettius Valence. Whence the lot of fortune and the spirit will have much power over the imposing and turning back of actions. That's just what it sounds like. They help and hinder things that you want to do. Four, the one, the lot of fortune, shows matters concerning the body and handicrafts. The spirit and its ruler matters concerning the soul and intellect. And actions through discourse and through giving and receiving. It will be necessary then to consider in what kind of sign the places and their rulers are, and to combine the nature of these signs for the determination of action and fortune, and for the kind of action. The word action here can probably be translated as deed, things you do. Okay, then there's another glorious little line from a little further on in Valence, where he says, We have also found the eleventh house from fortune to be an inquisitive place, a bestower of belongings and goods, and especially when benefics are upon it or testified. That's a really nice one. Because it turns out, you look at, if you look at the eleventh sign, from the lot of fortune and the planets in it and ruling it, you will find how well the person makes a living at what they do. And also, it gives you some hint as to what they do to make a living. He also mentions that the tenth sign from the lot of fortune is just like the tenth house from the ascendant. It's a second place to look for career. With this one difference. If the tenth sign from the fourth of the lot of fortune is not supported by the eleventh sign from the lot of fortune, the person will have a career at which he does not make a living and will make a living by something other than his career. We've discovered since then that all 11th houses are about making money. We're used to the second house being making money, but both Indian and Greek astrology use the 11th in preference to the second. Now this makes sense. Houses above the horizon tend to be connected with things you do in connection with other people, right? Houses below the horizon tend to be personal. So how can a job which makes you a living in connection with other people be indicated by something below the horizon? It would appear that the original meaning of the second has more to do with how well you keep money than in how you get it. So I describe the second house as a house of having money and the eleventh house as a house of getting it. We did a study recently of very wealthy people and it's the eleventh house that was delivering, not the second. Eleventh house we call friends, hopes, and wishes. Well, the Greeks call it the house of acquisition. It's where you get things. Yes? How well you're able to, well, okay, the question was how, what does it mean how you keep money? Well, some people manage to hold on to money, other people spend it very fast. 
That's what the second house is about. Let's say you inherit a fortune. You didn't get that by working. You inherited it. How well you hold on to it will be indicated by the second. So if you, so I'm sure you may have noticed this. A lot of people with Saturn in the second are very wealthy. And you say, how can they be wealthy with Saturn in the second? They keep it. They hold on to it for dear life. If they don't have it, they may have trouble getting it. But what they have, they keep. Jupiter in the second house more often means they spent a great deal than a person with a lot of money. But Jupiter in the 11th, or the 11th sign with a lot of fortune, is another matter entirely. At this point, I would not dream of doing either a financial analysis or a, or a vocational analysis without looking at the lot of fortune. I no longer consider this experimental. I now consider it as having been proven to my satisfaction. This is not medieval astrology, this is Greek. But it combines very well, not a big, combines very well with medieval astrology. But remember, you can count the houses from the ascendant any way you like. I'm not going to argue. But when you're counting from the lot of fortune or any other lot, count the signs. Now, question? Let's say if the lot of fortune is 15 in Virgo, the 11th house would be cancer. Correct. Is that 3 or 15? 0. Back up here. The question was, we have a lot of fortune in 15 in Virgo. Cancer is the 11th sign. Does the house of acquisition begin at 15 Cancer or at 0 Cancer? And the answer is 0 Cancer. These are not equal houses. These are whole sign houses. Whole sign houses start at 0 degrees of the sign, or more correctly, the first degree of the sign, and end at the 30th degree of the sign. This is the world's simplest house system. And it's the one used in sun sign astrology to this day. You have no idea how the sun sign astrologers I know are thrilled with this discovery. Because everybody's accused them of using a stupid technique, when in fact they were using a correct technique for a stupid idea.
trade out a couple if we can get back to lunch early. Back to FDR. This is a good example. Because FDR is an octurnal verb. FDR's part of fortune is in 28 Aries 9. Therefore, Aries is the first house of the Fortuna houses. Even though the lot is at 28 plus degrees. Doesn't matter. No matter where you put a lamp in a room, only that room is illuminated. And the signs are treated like rooms separated by walls. So the planets are like lights in a room. They only illuminate that room. So if your light happens to be the color of a horoscopos, it will illuminate the entire sign that it is in. And only that sign. The idea that houses could cross sign boundaries is a later idea and appears to be an error. <coughs> now, maybe a correct error. A correct error is an idea that is right for the wrong reason. I'm not going to say that's not true. I don't know. But I can tell you it didn't occur to anybody to do this until Ptolemy wrote his book and was misunderstood. There are no examples of modern style house division used to interpret meaning before Ptolemy. There are examples of modern type house systems used for other purposes, but not for the meanings of the planets. To the Greek, a house is something that a sign does. That's why they call them places. What place does Aries occupy? Aries occupies the place of Fortuna. But notice that, by the way, they think of Aries as occupying Fortuna, not as Fortuna as occupying Aries. The first place in FDR's chart with regard to the Ascendant is Virgo. The second place is Libra. They always call them places. They are the places where the signs were located. Again, I am not telling you to throw out your modern houses, except don't do equal houses with the lots. Do whole sign. So, we got, we got Aries, Fortuna, which makes Aquarius the 11th sign. Aquarius is occupied by Mercury, Sun, and Venus. All of these would relate to the way in which he makes a living. Now the Lord of Fortuna is Mars, because Fortuna is in Aries. And Mars is in the Ascendant tent, trining Mercury, the ruler of acquisition. In acquisition, excuse me, trining Mercury in acquisition. So he makes his money through a Mercury-Mars activity. Politician, orator, speaker. Not so much writer. Also, FDR created a new order called the New Deal. That is a classic bit of Aquarian terminology. See, Aquarius is Saturn creating new order. We only think of Saturn as holding on to old order, but Saturn is equally good at creating new order. So, this Mercury in, for, in acquisition leads me to an interesting point. Had he wished to, he could have been an astrologer. Although that would have been a waste of his talents. Because it's not, there are probably better things. But I will give you uh, an aphorism on Fortuna concerning Mercury, which I found to be quite reliable. It is much easier to make a living doing astrology <coughs> make a living is the operative word. It is much easier to make a living doing astrology if Mercury is in the sign of the lot of fortune or the eleventh sign of the lot of fortune or rules the lot of fortune or rules the eleventh sign of the lot of fortune. 
In other words, you either want Mercury in the same sign as the lot of fortune, or the eleventh sign, or you want Virgo or Gemini to be in those places. Case in point, my lot of fortune is Leo, the eleventh sign from Leo is Gemini, it's ruled by Mercury. Now I have Uranus in Gemini, so I also make a living doing computer programming for astrology. I don't write computer programming for any other purpose. Uh, my partner, Gary Christen, has the lot of fortune in Scorpio. The eleventh sign is Virgo. It is ruled by Mercury. Everything he does is astrologically related. Now, I'm not saying that it's the only way you can make a living at astrology, but it helps. Uh, Mercury in the tenth sign from the lot probably is also good, although that says more that you are going to do astrology as a life than as a living. It is very good to have benefics in or ruling the 11th sign of Fortuna. It is also very good to have benefics in Fortuna. It is also very good to have them in the 11th sign of the Ascendant. And here I do mean sign. Um, this, of course, assumes that the benefics are in reasonably decent condition. Okay, let's take another example. Marilyn Monroe, yes. Good, decisive instance. Now, if you look at Marilyn Monroe, we're going to look for the way in which she makes money. Now, using modern astrology, she's got Virgo on the cusp of the second. <coughs> Mercury is in Gemini in the tenth, which basically would indicate that she makes some money doing what she does for a living. Okay, I can live with that. Doesn't tell us a bloody thing about how. She certainly wasn't a writer. <laughs> She married one. She was not a writer. She's not exactly an orator. She speaks, or she spoke in what she did for a living, but that isn't the first thing that comes to mind. Does that seem fair? Lot of Fortune is in Aries conjunct Venus. That is, Venus is in the Lot of Fortune. There's your first clue. The 11th sign is Aquarius. It contains the Moon and Jupiter. So, the moon could very easily be read as she does something that involves being female, sex goddess. It's opposed to Neptune, so it's illusory, but it gets much better than this. You know what industry the moon rules? Films. Because the moon rules all industries that deal with images. Not Neptune, although Neptune's in on moon rules all industries that have to do with images. Rules television, video cameras, ordinary cameras. And just to give you some idea how gloriously this worked, what was the principal element used in making film until recently? Does anyone know? What chemical element was used in exclusively making silver. silver? Which is ruled by? You got it. See how well it works? But video cameras, which have no silver, are still lunar because they capture images. The moon is called the Kabbalah, the treasure house of images. So, the way she makes a living is through an image. And she has Jupiter in the house of acquisition and in Fortuna, which means she does make a living at it successfully. You will see that Fortuna houses give you a much better idea of her success at making a living than the Ascendant houses. Now, were we to go to the 11th house from the Ascendant, we'd come up again with Mercury as its ruler, and Mercury is in Gemini. That's good. The Lord of the, Lord of the 11th is in the 11th, going by signs now, not houses. That's good, but again, it doesn't tell us much. It's the Fortuna houses that deliver. Fortuna
Luna conjunct Venus and Moon and Jupiter together in acquisition. Uh, by the way, while we're at it, Venus sextiles Jupiter and the Moon sextiles Fortuna. Very close. So this, is, this, this chart indicates a successful ability to make a career in films. Now, the Neptune is important here because basically it was an illusion that she was creating. That's appropriate. You see how well this works? Try it out. Uh, it's about time for lunch, so we'll stop now and we'll do some more of these after lunch. Good question? Yeah, good question. Yes, that's a lot of spirit. The olive with the toothpick through it is a lot of spirit. It's the Greek letter phi, actually. Phi. Okay. Um, 3.30? Resume at 3.30. Turned off again.
can indicate where your fortune comes from in your personal life. But for the most part, it doesn't seem to be terribly important where it's located in the houses. Sagittarius is the 11th sign from Aquarius. It is ruled by Jupiter. Jupiter is in the second house conjunct Pluto. We're off to a good start. Uh, oh, by the way, the birth data are uh, 28th of October, 1955, 9.15 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. 9.15 p.m. So, we have Jupiter in the second house in Leo, uh, conjunct, by the way, a first magnitude star called Regulus, which is a star of royalty. It's getting better. However, here is what is really, oh yes, in the, if you use whole sign houses, and I rather like doing that, from the ascendant, then all of Leo is the second house. Look what else is in the second house. Uranus. How did he make his money? Computers. Now, what else can we show here? Well, under the heading of, and now for something completely different, about 
because they were never documented by Microsoft. Microsoft products all used them. Everybody else, without knowing they were there, had to write new equivalents, which slowed them down tremendously. This is highly illegal. But at this point, I think Bill Gates owns the government. Not literally, but uh, he's very powerful. When, my, when Word Perfect discovered this, they were a trifle upset, because one of the things that delayed their program was having to reinvent all of the software that was already present in Windows, but nobody knew about it. Um, for this reason, Microsoft has had several actions against it by the government for violation of antitrust. So far, none of them have actually gotten through. But I suspect it's only a matter of time before they do. OK, now, just, just, for, the set, just for amusement's sake, I have also computed a lot of theft, which is just what it sounds like. Here is the formula for the lot of theft. And this is the only lot that has this peculiar feature. The ascendant is not involved. The formula for the lot of theft is by day, Saturn plus Mars minus Mercury. Saturn plus Mars minus Mercury. By night, Saturn plus Mercury minus Mars. Now, Bill Gates' lot of theft is 28 Scorpio 3. It has nothing to do whatsoever with either the lot of the House of Acquisition or the Second House or the Part of Fortune, except that it squared the Part of Fortune by sign. From this, we can conclude that while Bill Gates uses treachery, he does not use theft.
percentage rates are very high, but the risk of never getting your money back is also very high. That's why they're called junk bonds. And they're perfectly legal. But Michael Milken did things with these bonds that were not legal. And consequently, spent a fair amount of time recently in jail. Okay. The lot of fortune is Libra. Okay? The place of acquisition is Leo. Containing Mercury, Pluto, and Venus. And the lot of theft. The lot of theft is in the place of acquisition. Meaning, he acquires by theft. What he did was, in fact, stealing. Highly elaborate, technical, but stealing. Now, his lot of treachery is in Libra, near Jupiter and Neptune. Libra is the sign of a lot of fortune. So he has treachery in Fortuna and theft in the place of acquisition. He made a lot of money, which is perfectly reasonable given the fact that Jupiter is in the same sign as a lot of fortune. Do keep in mind that, the, that being in the sign of a lot of fortune is at least as good as being in the sign of acquisition. Either one will do nicely. Notice that the Lord of Acquisition is in his whole sign 12, the House of Imprisonment. He has Leo in the place of Acquisition. Its ruler is the Sun. The Sun is in Cancer in the 12th house by sign and near the 12th house cusp by house. He also has Saturn in the 12th. So this is actually, he has very strong indications of imprisonment. Did he have to do this? No. But without astrology to suggest otherwise, why shouldn't he? This is the kind of fate that is caused by ignorance rather than destiny.
is a possible indication of sudden downfall, just the way Saturn on the ordinary would have. This is actually called in the Greek literature superior position. If a planet is 270 degrees away from another point, like the midheaven is to the ascendant, roughly, this is called superior position. And the planet that has this dominates the other planet. It's a special type of square. The Greeks did not consider both squares to be equivalent. They considered the planet that was in the 10th house position to be stronger than the planet that was in the first house position and to and be very effective in determining the outcome of that planet in the first house position. Uh, we don't have a lot of experience of this doctrine. We've just noticed it repeatedly actually in the Greek literature. Uh, for our purposes, all we have to do today is say Saturn is in a 10th house relationship to the part of fortune indicating the possibility of downfall. Now, this technique raises a number of questions. I'm sure a lot of questions. One simple question that could be asked is, do you relate the lot houses to the regular ones? The answer is yes because you'll notice that I took Saturn's 12th ascendant sign position and related it to its 10th Fortuna sign position. A career outcome leading to imprisonment. Now, before you all start running to discover if, you're, if you have 12th house planets squaring the plot of fortune, deciding you're all going to a prison. <laughs> Do keep in mind that even the ancients believed you needed quite a few indications before you could expect this kind of an effect. So let's see if Michael Milken has any other indications that he might wind up in prison. He didn't stay long, by the way, just a couple of years. But it did pretty well ruin his career. OK. According to Bonatti, there are three houses that pertain to a prison. We usually use only one. He said the fourth, the eighth, and the twelfth all pertain to a prison. He makes a distinction among these, which is a bit hard to follow, but basically they all pertain to a prison. So let's look at these three houses and see if certain patterns repeat. First of all, we have Scorpio on the fourth, Mars ruling Scorpio is in the second sign of money. So one of the houses of imprisonment has its ruler in the second sign of money. That's a good start, or a bad start, depending on your point of view. We go to the eighth. And it, ha it is ruled by Jupiter. Jupiter is in the lot of fortune. The ruler of the eighth is in the sign of the lot of fortune. This is, an, this is a tie-up again between income and imprisonment. By the way, if we took the actual degree of the eighth, we might conceivably come up with some other ruler for the eighth. But Jupiter is certainly at least domicile. We go to the 12th, and it's the moon. And the moon is also in the second sign of money. And of course, if that were not enough, in the 12th house, we have Saturn, Mercury, and Pluto. And in the 12th sign, we have Saturn and the sun. Every one of the houses of a prisoner is connected to money in some way. And the 12th house itself is rather badly populated. I think he should have followed a more spiritual path. 
Because, curiously enough, many kinds of spiritual path have the same symbolism as imprisonment. The difference is they're voluntary. It is not 
not assured that he will die a wealthy man. Yes, Uranus makes an opposition to Jupiter. However, that, thank you for pointing that out because it enables me to make a point that isn't obvious. The modern planets do not seem to be able to afflict the lot of fortune or its ruler. All they do is indicate something funny about it. Um, the fact that Uranus opposes Jupiter means that there is something unusual, offbeat, or strange in the way he, he makes money. Ah, but because it is in the seventh from the house of acquisition, it could indicate a sudden loss also. Um, one in, one uh, rather funny thing, according to Valence, if the ruler of acquisition <coughs> is in the seventh house from acquisition, that is to say, the opposing house, the person will spend too much money on whatever that planet rules. I have Gemini as the ruler of acquisition, and Mercury is in Sagittarius. I spend too much money on books. Now you may think, well, isn't that funny? Ha ha, he spends, he buys a lot of books. No, folks. The books I buy are three and four thousand dollars each. Because they're all published before 1600. And they're in Latin. Actually, I've only bought one at 3,500 so far. Mercury and Sagittarius. I buy knowledge. And I'll pay through the nose for it. <laughs> Curiously enough, Sagittarius is my sixth sign, so it's what I work at. So it actually works out okay. But at least in my chart, valence is principle works. So, because he has three arguable malefics opposing Fortuna and itself, and Uranus opposing the Lord of Acquisition in Acquisition, there is a serious danger that he may at some point lose all or most of his fortune. So it's not he's not assured of being a wealthy man with that. Now, I don't know why exactly, but it is interesting to note if the Lord of, if the part of fortune is conjunct the moon, <coughs> the moon is the ruler of the egg. <coughs> Indicating something to do with the death could be the cause of his loss of money. And given current circumstances, that makes sense. Okay, who else do I have here? Yes? That is the first house in general? No, the 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 basis of the Oh, okay. Uh, the lot of fortune is Aquarius. Two sign eleven signs forward from Aquarius is Sagittarius. In general, the Jupiter's in the first house? I have Jupiter in the first house. I mean it may mean he's fat. But not Sagittarius, though. Um, Jupiter in the first house just indicates that his general nature is Jupiterian. Oh, it has nothing to do with its being the first house. That's unimportant. It's just an accident. Once you, it, it probably, well, not quite. I'll take that back. It probably means that he does it in part on his own efforts. As a matter of fact, you would know. As a matter of fact, um, there is some medieval lore that pertains to the ruler of the second, but it can be applied just as well to the ruler of acquisition. The house of the ruler indicates the source of the money. So, um, the fact that the ruler is in the first house would mean, at least in part, he gets it by his own work. If 
that's in the second, I'll give you the whole 12. You like that? Yeah. yeah. This pertains to the ruler of acquisition and the ruler of the second. Ruler of, ruler of acquisition, or let's just say ruler of money, okay? We'll let it go back. The ruler of money, which you should always understand is acquisition or second, in the first means you make it yourself at least in part. In the second, this is from the ascendant now, in the second it means you make it through having money already, like investments. In the third, through communications, siblings, or other third house means. In the fourth, from your family or from real estate. In the fifth, the ancients would have said from your children, we would probably add investments and speculation. Possibly from your lover, but possibly. In the sixth, through work, small animals, employees, or slaves. Remind me to tell you a small animal story. Six house rules small animals, up to about the size of a dog. Medium dog. <coughs> slaves or employees. These days there isn't much difference. Seventh house through partnership or marriage. Eighth house through death or inheritance. Seventh house through partnership or marriage. Eighth house through death or inheritance. Or partner's money. Or what? Partner's money. Partner means marital partner or a partner business partner. Ninth, through traveling, foreign places, or in the Middle Ages from the church. It's a funny comment here. Vanati notes that the ninth house is the twelfth house from the tenth house. And he says, this is why the church so often works against the king. The church is the secret enemy of the king. <laughs> that may be true here also. As I know there's been some fairly serious warfare between the church and state in this country. Uh, the ruler in question in the tent from the government or the king or persons in power over it. From the government, the king, or persons in power over it. From the eleventh, friends. From the twelfth, from large animals, large animals, Horses, cows, yep. lions. Yes, I guess they would be up there. Yep. <laughs> Leopards would be borderline. Snakes are definitely sixth house. Unless you mean pythons. Unless you mean pythons. Unless you mean big snakes. Okay, twelfth house. Uh, that's that's uh, actually hunting is a seventh house election. I'll ask you why. I guess the animal is the opponent. Um, the twelfth also could mean through through things like hospitals, asylums, and prisons. A what? Yeah, uh, underworld activities could be twelfth house also. I would guess. Now, several years ago, seven to be exact. The reason I can say seven is because it was the last time Saturn squared my Neptune. Now it's opposing it, as we speak. Um, I was expecting the usual difficult Saturn-Neptune stuff, which is being depressed, anxious.
anxious, fearful, jolly stuff like that. Okay, transiting Saturn was in my sixth house, squaring Neptune my fourth. Transiting Saturn was in Capricorn. Capricorn, as we all know, was related to goats. As the transit became exact, there was a knock on my front door, and there was a man outside asking if he could rent my barn to keep his goats in. Goats are right up at the top of the small animal range. Saturn in Capricorn rules goats. Neptune in the fourth house of real estate, barn in my house. But just to complete the Neptune, several weeks later, after owing a number of people in town money that he didn't pay off, he disappeared, goats and all. There was the Neptune. I didn't mind. He left behind a portable radio, some good electrical equipment, and he cleaned out barn. But it was that was very funny because it had no psychological effect whatsoever. The events worked out completely on the material level. Oh, getting back to the 12th 6th. One of the criteria is the 12th is animals large enough to be ridden. That's the key. Whether you ride them or not is another matter, but they are large enough to be ridden. Now, you may ask, why should large animals be in the 12th house? And I answer, I haven't the faintest idea. <laughs> what? Your theory? No, it's not secret My horse is my secret enemy? <laughs> Sometimes, maybe, yes. <laughs>
reason I like to look at her is I'm not sure she knew who her parents were. Certainly not her father. Okay. This is a daytime chart. So we, now, notice the way I compute this in my head. The arc is going to go from the sun to Saturn. Okay? By the way, I haven't let, looked at this before. This could be a total bomb. But I doubt it. Okay, the sun is at 10, 11 degrees Gemini. Saturn is at 22 Scorpio. Okay? Uh, what? Right. 161 degrees. Yeah. I prefer to think of it as 19 degrees short of an opposition. Because that's the way I do the thing in my head. Yes. It's 161 degrees from the sun to Saturn which is 19 degrees less than an opposition. So, I go from Leo, uh, 13 Leo, and I subtract from 13 Aquarius, 19 degrees. By the way, this is just a crazy way of doing the formula. Don't worry about it. The way you do math in your head is very different from the way you do it on paper. You attack every problem differently. Uh, 13 Leo minus 19, that'd be 3 Leo, 0 Leo, 16 is 13, uh, 27 of, not Leo, sorry, uh, square is 27 of Capricorn. If anybody's got a calculator, you can try it out. I can also do it on my computer. Okay, let me see if I got that. <laughs> Easier to pass on doing the calculations, at least. Everybody does it differently. I'm now resorting to the time honor ploy of checking the computer.
which is her own sun sign. Now the lot of the mother being the sun sign of the daughter indicates that the connection with her mother is pretty tight. Um, it's actually closer to the Mercury. That's really about all I can say because I don't know too much about her mother either. But now I'm going to show you something interesting. What is the relationship between Gemini and Capricorn? What's the aspect? Twin comes, which is not an aspect in traditional astrology. There is no aspect between the lot of the father and the lot of the mother, which indicates that they basically didn't connect. Now, we could also use the ruler of the lot of the mother and the ruler of the lot of the father, in which case we're looking at Mercury and Saturn. What is the relationship between Gemini and Scorpio? Another point comes. Another indication that they didn't get together. But the chart does indicate that her connection with the mother was closer than her connection with her father. Because she doesn't have anything in Capricorn to speak of, and the ruler afflicts everything all over the place. Whereas, the ruler of the lot of the mother is, is in the lot of the mother in conjunct the sun. Uh, I'll give you a really extraordinarily clear-cut case. The lot of the mother in my chart is conjunct my mother's son. That's where I was raised by my mother. Okay. <coughs> Back to Franklin. Back to Frank. Bear with me a moment while I retrieve his chart. Which is why he died when Franklin was fairly young. 
He wasn't a young man when he died. Franklin was a late child. Anything else before the topic? Let's see here. Oh, yes. Let's continue working with the law of the Father for a moment. The law of the Father. Yes, question? Also notice 
by the way, that Mars, in jump the lot of the father, is the ruler of the lot of the mother. So there's another indication of affinity. There was, however, a rather interesting age gap between them. She was in her early 20s when they got married, and he was in his early 50s. Which is why he died when Franklin was fairly young. He wasn't a young man when he died. Franklin was a late child. Oh yes, let's continue working with the lot of the father for a moment. The lot of the father, yes, question?
In fact, we have the lot of fortune to conjunct the lot of the mother, sextile by its lord, Mars. Okay? Because he is born at night, in addition, the moon is insect and Saturn is out. Okay? Do you see that in general, the indicator of the mother is in better shape than the indicator of the father? This is what shows which parent dies first. Find this in all manner of Greek texts. You take the planet that indicates the parent, and you take the lot of the parent, and you generally evaluate which one is in better condition. And sect is the most important indicator here. Sect and aspects. The signs actually aren't terribly important. The fact that the moon is in Cancer is nice, but not terribly important. What is important is the moon is in Hides. And Saturn is in contrariety of Hides. So that's your first indication that the mother is going to die after the father. In addition, if we use the moon for the mother, and Saturn for the father, or excuse me, if we, if we go back to the lots, I already did that, if we go back to the lots, we find Mars can jump the lot of the father, which is a malefic, and Saturn is square the sun. Tightly enough, thank you. So the indicator for the father afflicts the sun, which is the other indicator of the father in the daytime. So all around, we find the father indicators are in worse shape than the mother indicators. This does not mean that the child relates to either parent better or worse. It indicates which one dies first. Now you might ask, why would anybody be interested in such a morbid question? Nowadays, it doesn't matter too much. But in those days, well not in those days, in ancient times, if the father died a long time before the mother, the family would be in big trouble. Because the father was sort of the defender and breadwinner of the family, and a widow was not a person who had a good time getting along. Now it's not so much of an issue. Consequently, ancient astrologers spent a lot of time trying to figure out which parent died first. Now, I have <coughs> noticed that this only works when there is a fairly large difference in the times between the two deaths. If the parents die within a year or two of each other, you can't tell which one's going to die first. It has to make a difference. In the case of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the difference was something on the order of 40 years difference. That's why it's so clear. Now, what's bizarre about this is we tend to think of charts as being psychological in nature in modern astrology. Yet here is something over which the individual has absolutely no control in any ordinary sense of the word being shown in the chart of the individual. You do not make, usually, one parent die sooner than the other, unless maybe you have to drive that parent nuts, or shoot them, or something. <laughs> but normally, you are not the cause of the difference between your parent's deaths. The first principle, then, is which indicator is out of sect. And for this, we only use the chart. We don't worry about light and signs. We just want the chart. All things being equal, the planetary indicator that is out of sect, will, that parent will die first. All things being equal is a very important statement. If the indicator for the out of sect parent is well aspected and well placed, 
and the insect parent is poorly situated and debilitated, then the out of sect parent will last longer. So you can't just say that nighttime births, the father dies first, and daytime births, the mother dies first. But if this principle is correct in a large scale statistical study, it should show up that nocturnal births have the father die first and diurnal births have the mother die first in a statistically significant number of cases. Now you may ask a very interesting question. What happens if you have lots of children? Okay? It's the eldest that is supposed to show this most clearly. The eldest child. But in my brother's case, both of our charts show it. Uh, I'm a nocturnal birth, second son. My father indicator is Saturn. It is out of sect and opposes my son. My mother indicator is the moon. It is in sect, making an application to its own ruler, which is dignified. He's okay. Father dies first. My brother has the same thing, the same kind of thing. <coughs> We're both nocturnal births. So if I were going to do this statistical study, I would do it with uh, eldest children. Because that's what the old books say is most often going to be the case. Now, I'd like to make a few warnings. The important thing to do at this point would be to look at your children's charts and see which parent is going to die first. Okay? Um, I don't recommend you do look at it at all. Go ahead and look, but don't take the results too seriously because we're still in early stages of evaluating this. It's just what bothered us about this is when we started playing with this at the phase conclave last summer, every case we tried worked. That doesn't happen very often, but it is a little tricky. Let us assume for the moment that the parent indicators are in roughly equivalent condition. What do you do then? Well, you can assume, perhaps, that the parents will die at about the same time. Or you go to the lots of the parents and see what's happening with them. That's one of the reasons why I think in Marilyn Monroe's case, I would guess the father died sooner than the mother. But on the other hand, we don't know because she never knew him. And that might actually be what the chart is showing, that she never knew him. She was illegitimate. Oh, there's one thing we should try. Uh, well, I won't try this. It doesn't work in your chart. Now, if you really want to get paranoid, the men in the audience. <laughs> I have absolutely no evidence that this aphorism works. But according to the Greeks, if the ruler of the lot of the father is in the seventh house from the lot of the father, the child is not yours. <laughs> <laughs> if the ruler of the lot of the father in a father's child, not in a mother's child, mothers have no ambiguity about this, unless the gypsies are around. So, for the point, if, so if, if a father looks at a child's chart, it is alleged, and finds that the ruler of the lot of the father, the child's chart, is in the seventh sign of the lot of the father, the child is not his. Seven. I wish to say that I make absolutely no guarantee whatsoever about the reliability of this technique. <laughs> So, if you're at all paranoid about it, I recommend you don't check. <laughs> okay? I just thought you might find that amusing. Generally speaking, it's not supposed to be a good thing for the ruler of a lot to 
be in the seventh sign from the lot. This may be a major mistake. 
maybe we should be using the spirit houses for psychological purposes. In which case, I have Saturn conjunct the lot of spirit. So Saturn clearly represents, for me, a major spiritual problem. I will cheerfully agree with that assessment. I don't like Saturn very much. I realize that's my problem. But it's real. We haven't done a lot of work with this though, so I just recommend looking at it with an with a unprejudiced eye and seeing what you can come up with. The other thing is when the lot of fortune oops, back up. When you're born at a new moon, if you're born exactly at a new moon, the lot of spirit and the lot of fortune are both conjunct the ascendant. Because remember, we're calculating the arc from the sun to the moon, or from the moon to the sun. If that arc is zero, then the lots will land on the ascendant. In which case, for certain purposes, valence will give the second sign to the lot of spirit. If the lot of fortune and the lot of spirit are on the same sign, you will move the lot of spirit to the next sign. I don't know if this is bogus or not. Similarly, at a full moon, the lot of fortune and the lot of spirit will be on the descent. Similarly, he would move a lot of spirit to the next sign. For most of you, this will not be a problem, and I would simply experiment. Uh, let me report one thing I did find. In a rather small number of autistic children, that word makes sense in Spanish? Okay. Autistic children seem to have very badly afflicted lots of spirit to the degree or two. A lot of spirit seems to be badly afflicted within a degree or two. So that's an indication, although preliminary at best, that a lot of spirit is indeed a psychological point. Doesn't matter. All we need, all we want to know is the sign. In the case of the autistic children, I probably wouldn't move it at all. But I've never seen that happen, where the lot of fortune was conjunct the lot of spirit to an autistic child. Just uh, while we're on the subject of doing full moons for a moment, the ancients quite routinely put the degrees of the prenatal lunation or full moon, whichever was closer, into the chart, and treated them as points. Uh, there are a variety of calculations that are made from these points. Uh, and for the full moon, there was a variation. Ptolemy recommended using whichever light would be above the horizon in your chart. Others used the moon. The new moon, there's no problem. Okay, let's take a short break. I'm going to look at a couple of more wealthy people. And I'm also going to look at the chart. Uh, one of the wealthy people has some interesting parent issues. So we're going to combine them. Then I will conclude the day by giving you some other parts for you to play with including all sorts of lots of marriage. There seems to be a general creativity on the subject of a lot of marriage, but I have some opinions. Okay. This is Donald Trump, king of the gambling palaces, among other things. Has owned at various times airlines, this, that, and the other thing. Has had a number of flashy wives and romances. His data are June 14, 1946, 
9.51 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time in beautiful downtown Queens, New York, which if you know anything about Queens is a contradiction in terms. It was better then, though. Okay. Uh, we have here the situation I was describing a moment ago with a lot of fortune and spirit are conjunct because he was born at a full moon. Now, I earlier mentioned that Valence advocated under certain circumstances moving the lot of spirit ahead to one side. However, I should say that's under certain circumstances, not generally. So, for what we're doing now, we'll leave that alone. Besides which, I'm not doing anything with spirit anyhow. Lot of fortune at a full moon is always in the seventh house. So, that's Aquarius making Sagittarius acquisition, ruled by a benefic. I'd like to point out that, the benefic, that, that Sagittarius is also the fifth house of gambling. So, at the house of acquisition is the house of gambling. Not bad for a start. Uh, the moon is in the fifth, or excuse me, in acquisition. Jupiter is the lord of acquisition. And Jupiter is in a really interesting grand trine with the lot of fortune, Uranus, and itself. And Jupiter sextiles the moon, which opposes Uranus. Well, you may say, that's an indication that he may lose all his money, and yes it is, but probably not permanently, because Jupiter making a sextile to one end, the, 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 namely to the moon, and a trine to the other end, namely Uranus, stabilizes the opposition. But in fact, a couple of years ago, he did nearly go bankrupt. Jupiter uh, sextiles the moon in acquisition, so acquisition is in pretty good shape in this chart. And he does describe quite well his uh, means of making money. Okay? This is a pretty good acquisition house. Any questions before I remove it? Next chart is Andrew Carnegie. Who was interesting in that he made a vast quantity of money and gave away almost 90% of it. That's interesting. People don't usually do that. He, he left enough money to keep his heirs happy, but he gave away most of his fortune. All over the United States, you will find local libraries named Carnegie Library because he paid for their being built. And the Carnegie Hall too? Carnegie Hall too, same person. And there are Carnegie Halls all over the place. Basically, he invested all of his money in things that would improve the educational standards of people all over the country. There's also a Carnegie Institute of Technology, which is only slightly inferior to MIT in quality. So he, he basically figured that he made it and it was up to him to do something good with it. Uh, I would say this qualifies him as a better than average human being. Although he did have one rather nasty bit with a strike at one of his plants where the uh, strike was put down rather savagely. Um, it has been alleged in his defense that he did not authorize this but he did take responsibility for it. His data are, November 25th, 1835, at 6 a.m. local mean time, Dunfermline, Scotland. You better look at it, you'll never get it from a pronunciation. It's pronounced Dunfermline. Old ballad, the king 
sits in the door of the grandfather's house, drinking the blood red wine, and so forth. I won't, I won't offend you by singing. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. uh, those that don't have an atlas, that's 56 north in 4 minutes, 3 west in 29. And we're lucky because this could have produced some really strange looking houses. Lot of fortune is Virgo. Its ruler is Mercury. And the house of acquisition is Cancer, featuring Jupiter in exaltation. We're off to a good start. Jupiter is also in the ninth house and sign of the ascendant. Here you have the first hint that he would give it away to educate people. Uh, Jupiter's aspects, Jupiter trines Mercury, the lord of the lot of fortune, in conjunct the ascendant. Now, interestingly enough, if we go to the second house of the ascendant, we get a hint of how we made his money. It contains Mars. Mars rules steel. And Carnegie Steel was the largest single component of what later became the United States Steel Corporation. Although, that was when Carnegie sold it to J.P. Morgan, who has Mars conjunct Jupiter in the house of acquisition, Big Steel. Now, Mars itself has no particular connection with the house of acquisition, except that Jupiter rules the second house Sagittarius in the house of acquisition and disposes of the Mars. So there's the connection with steel. Again, we have the same kind of big steel symbolism in this chart we have with Morgan. Now we have Saturn in the 12th house in this chart. This is often an indication of a difficult early life. I'll tell you a little bit about Carnegie. He was born in Scotland, as we know from the chart, and his father was a weaver. And when his father was young, this is after all 1835, when his father was young, weaving was done in houses, and the cloth was sold to the manufacturers by the individual weavers. But of course, in the late 18th century, the Industrial Revolution began, and weaving was done in factories. And small weavers either had to work for the factories, in the factories, or be driven out of business. Carnegie's father refused to go into the factories, and continued trying to make a living weaving at home. This didn't work. So the family became increasingly poor, and finally emigrated to the United States. The lot of the father is 13 Sagittarius, 48. The ruler of the lot of the father is in the ninth house of foreign travel, suggesting that there is something about his father who would cause him to have to travel to a foreign land. The fact that Mars is in the house of the father is a good starting hint that the father would predecease the mother. But let's take a look at that further. The mother, by the way, is 18... I wrote that so badly, I can't tell if it's a Scorpio or a Virgo. Virgo, 18 Virgo, 22. Okay, this is a nocturnal chart, which means that the moon signifies the mother, and Saturn signifies the father. Saturn is in contrariety of highs in the 12th. First sign, 12th house. Uh, Saturn squares Neptune. Interestingly enough, uh, 
his father found it so difficult to make a living even this even in America that he took the drink and this eventually killed him. The father predeceased the mother. Um, the mother, indicated by the moon, Aquarius, is in square to Mercury, but that's not too tragic. Sextile to Pluto, and nothing really wrong with the moon. 18 Virgo 22 makes Virgo the lot of the mother. We have a lot of fortune in the lot of the mother, and she did, in fact, instill in him his work habits which were puritanical in the extreme. This was a typical Scotsman. That is, early to bed, go to work. I mean, early to rise, go to work, early to bed. Or maybe not so early to bed, but work a little longer. Um, there is nothing wrong with, well, there is nothing wrong with Virgo and its ruler is Mercury on the ascendant. So this chart clearly indicates the predecessor of the father. Here's another example of that principle. Okay. Let's see if there's anything else worth commenting on here. Oh, I think not. Okay. Now for lots and lots and lots. That pun won't work in Spanish. <laughs> There are about three dozen used by the Greeks, most only occasionally. The lot of children is a particularly problematical one. You'll hear why in a moment. But before I do, let me give you the lot of brothers, because the lot of the brothers is part of the problem. When I say brothers, by the way, it's brothers and sisters. The lot of brothers and sisters is by day ascendant plus Jupiter minus Saturn. Now, some people reverse it by night and some don't. <laughs> One of those. The lot of children by day is ascendant plus Saturn minus Jupiter. The reverse. Brothers by day is ascendant plus Jupiter minus Saturn. Children by day is ascendant plus Saturn minus Jupiter. They have the same relationship as fortune and spirit. The problem is, do you reverse them at night? And the answer is, some say yes, some say no. So the problem here is, it's very hard to tell at night which one is the lot of brothers and which one is the lot of children? And I don't have an answer for you. What I would suggest you do if you're born at night and you have children is use the one for the lot of children that clearly describes your eldest child. What I mean by that is the lot will be conjunct some major point child's chart will be of some major sign of the child's chart or will be in a sign ruled by a major planet of the child's chart. Okay. Now we come to one of several lots of marriage. The first one I'm going to give you, I believe, is the lot of legal marriage. But nobody ever says this. But when you hear the symbolism, you'll see why I think it's the lot of legal marriage. For men, it matters whether it's men or women in all cases. The lot of marriage for men is ascendant plus Venus minus Saturn. How do you see why it's the lot of legal marriage? Saturn is involved. For women, the lot equals ascendant plus Saturn minus Venus. It's the reverse. 
neither of these reverse at night. Thank God. And everybody <laughs> agrees on that point. Now, there is, however, a small problem. Do we make this the ascendant of marriage and make houses from it? Or do we make this the ascendant of the other marital partner to make houses from it? That's not clear. My impression is this describes marriage, not the marital partner. But I'm not certain. You're getting here now work in progress. My impression is that these lots describe not the marital partner, but the marriage itself. Okay, now, another lot of marriage for man is ascendant plus Venus minus sun. Now this is rather interesting because in the Middle Ages this lot is still called a lot of marriage but it's also called the lot of trickery by women toward men. <laughs> the lot of trickery by women toward men. Fear not. Because the lot of marriage for women is ascendant plus Mars minus moon. Ascendant plus Mars minus moon. Neither lot reverses at night. This is also called, in the Middle Ages, the lot of the trickery of men toward women. And the lot of marriage for men that I gave you a moment ago is also called the lot of lasciviousness of women. I like to call this the lot of anything that can happen to a man by a woman. <laughs> Good or bad. And similarly, I call the other one the lot of anything that can happen to a woman from a man. I think the first two, the Venus-Saturn lots, are the proper lots of marriage as an institution. But it's interesting to note that the seventh house, or sign, from the lot of marriage is called the house of adultery. The seventh sign from the lot of marriage is called the, the place of adultery. <laughs> Try that one out for size. Oh yes, there is yet another lot of marriage. <laughs> this one is described by the Greeks as a lot of marriage in general for both sexes. In the Middle Ages, it's called the Lot of Love's Happiness. Now this one could be a marital lot because it contains Jupiter. And Jupiter has to do with legal events just like Saturn. This one changes between day and night. It's Ascendant plus Jupiter minus Venus and by night, Ascendant plus Jupiter minus Venus. Did I say the same thing twice? Sorry. Re correction. By day, Ascendant plus Venus minus Jupiter. And by night, Ascendant plus Jupiter minus Venus. And this is the one, this is the one where the seventh sign is the place of adultery. Specifically this one. The other ones maybe, but primarily this one. This suggests that this is in fact a lot of legal marriage. Because you can't have adultery unless you have a legal marriage. By definition. I'll read you what Betty Valence wrote. Slightly simplifying the language. The place opposite to the lot, then, will be indicative of adultery. And if the lord of the lot of marriage should be found in the opposition, and the lord of the opposition be found in the lot of marriage, 
They will first commit adultery, later enter into a contract. In which first they commit adultery, then get married. It does seem to be somewhere in there there has to be a divorce. <laughs> and those who have contracted marriage will separate and again be brought together by adultery. <laughs> I'm not sure if this is really adultery. It may just be extramarital. It sounds like extramarital is what it should be. I'll have to ask you. It means outside of marriage, but they may not be married to anybody. No, like be married. That's not adultery. I have I have to question on that to make sure the word really means adultery. It's possible that's a mistranslation. Yes. The lot of marriage in the seventh. The Lord, excuse me, the Lord of the lot of marriage in the seventh, sorry. The Lord of the lot of marriage in the seventh from the lot. And the Lord of the seventh from the lot in the lot of marriage. You see, in other words, the first and seventh houses are exchanging rulers. In fact, they're in mutual reception. I can make that simpler. If the if the lords of the lot of marriage and the opposite house are a mutual reception, you will have this problem. They come together extramaritally or adulterously, I don't know which, get married, separate, and come together either in adultery or extramarital relationship. Clearly not a stable relationship. Now here's another interesting point which reveals something, a whole condition we haven't looked at. If the Lord of the lot of marriage should rise in the morning before the sun, if the Lord of the lot of marriage should rise in the morning before the sun, the person will marry early. This is generally the case. Anything that rises in the morning indicates something happening early in life. Yes. If, if the Lord of the lot of marriage should rise before the sun in the morning, it indicates an early marriage. But if it should rise in the evening, they will marry late. Uh, another point. The Lord of the Lot of Marriage. This is all the Venus Jupiter Lot, by the way. This is all the Venus Jupiter Lot. If the Lord, the Lord of the Lot of Marriage bestows the first marriage, while benefics harmonious with it, also bestow marriage, especially if the sign is double body. Translated translation. Double-bodied signs are Gemini, Virgo, Sagittarius, and Pisces. The general rule is anything that happens in those signs multiply by two. Okay. Here is the lot of death. This, the position of this lot in your houses will indicate sources of death. Now this one, you do not want to make into a chart. It doesn't make sense. All you want to do is to look and see where it falls in your birth chart. For example, if it fell in your second house, you simply spent too much money. If it falls in the first, probably the same thing. It falls in the third, your brothers and sisters or neighbors cause you to go into debt, and so forth. I think you can see how it works. The lot is ascendant plus Saturn minus Mercury by day and by night. Does not reverse. Yes. Ascendant plus Saturn minus Mercury by day and by night. 
Now we come to a really nasty one. This is the lot or place of accusation I mentioned before. Later known as the lot of incurable illnesses and humorously the lot of police. The lot of police. Policia. The ancients had a sense of humor. Or the more things change, the more they stay the same. The lot of accusation in the daytime is Ascendant plus Mars minus Saturn. And at night, it's Ascendant plus Saturn minus Mars. Reverses. I will read you some text on this lot. Regarding these matters, I shall manifest more completely the place of accusation. In other words, he's going to describe it. Which I have proved by experience. It is an instigator of the occasion of fear, of danger, and of imprisonment. It is one of the houses or places. And he gives the formula. Wherever it falls, that house will be a source of fear. If it is in a sign with malefics, I'm paraphrasing freely here, the original text is a little hard to read. If it is in a sign with malefics, or ruled by malefics, you're in trouble. <laughs> if it is inhabited or ruled by benefics, the place will still be a cause of fear, but you will come out okay. Now, we've done some experimenting with this one. And it doesn't mean that you're actually guilty of doing anything. You just get accused of it. It's kind of like a 12th house. I would describe it, in fact, as a 12th house lot. And it's a lot with a flavor similar to the 12th house. One of the examples he actually gives is of somebody who gets abducted by the military and impressed into service. The draft in the old days was done a little more informally than now. Uh, now, I don't know if you've ever had, do you have a draft? Your draft board calls you up and tells you to report at a certain time, date, and place. Well, in ancient times, a gang of, of ruffians came along and simply kidnapped you. And you wake up the next morning and you're informed you're in the army. And this is one of the things a lot of accusation can symbolize. Another, another time he mentions a person who was accused of committing adultery with another man's wife. He was innocent, but because of the benefics, he was proven to be innocent. Now, my favorite example for modern astrology is O.J. Simpson, who has a lot of accusation, conjunct Uranus to the degree, squaring the moon in the eighth house. So he's accused, he's brought to a sudden downfall by being accused of the death of a woman. Very good symbols. It does not tell you whether he did it or not. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay. One of the differences between this way of doing lots, the Arabic way, is that because most of these lots make house systems, you don't have to have as many lots. For example, the Arabs had the lot of the father exactly like the Greeks. 
but because they didn't use it as a house system, they had to have a second lot called the lot of the father's death. All the Greeks would have done is gone to the eighth sign from the lot of the father. They didn't need a separate lot. Um, similarly, there's a lot of the death of children in the Arab system. All the Greeks would have done is gone to the eighth house from whichever lot of children they were using. Um, yeah. The result of this is that the lot system for the Greeks is much simpler than the lot system for the Arabs. And you don't have to use the approximately 96 lots that the medieval astrologers used all the time, plus the other hundred or so they used for special occasions. Um, the best book available to give you something like the medieval, something of the medieval use of lots, there are no books on the Greek uses as well, is by Robert Zoller, and it's called uh, The Arabic Parts in Astrology or The Lost Key to Prediction published by Inner Traditions. And it features, among other things, a, an adequate but not terribly accurate translation of Bonatti's treatise on the parts. You will discover, for example, well, you will discover, not for example, you will discover that there are over 200 lots listed. <coughs> Al Biruni, I'll get to the question. Al-Biruni, who was one of the more rational of the Arab astrologers, made at the end of his discussion of the lots the comment, and their number increases daily. Question? On the lot of accusation, do we make a house? Uh, no. We just look at what house it falls into. And you would also want to look at what aspects are closer. See, that's the reason why the Arabs did what they did. Quite a few of the lots don't make house systems. But they never, they didn't use the lots for house systems. Or, the, excuse me, they occasionally did use the lots for house systems. But most of them didn't know about that device. And I can tell you that the lot of a father and the lot of a mother are a very good way of getting in touch with a person's experience of their father or mother. They work very well. Uh, so the lots I classify as one of the four or five major discoveries of Project Hindsight also. Not that there are lots, we've always known that, but they're proper users. Okay, how much time do we have left? Uh, 10 minutes, yeah. Okay, uh, that's not enough time to start any the news, so let's just throw the floor over to questions. Silence reigns supreme. Come on now. Yes. A lot of death is in the eighth house. Uh, that alone doesn't tell us anything. Uh, the lot of death is a little bit tricky. Um, as I recall, I just wrote it down for some of you. Some of uh, who was it I just showed it to? A lot of death. It was Saturn plus the eighth house plus minus the moon, right? Okay. The lot of death is Saturn, another one without the ascendant, by the way. Saturn plus the eighth house plus minus the moon. The problem is, who's eighth house plus? And moderns usually use the eighth house cusp of their favorite system. Okay, fine. But I would also suggest you try zero degrees of the eighth sign of the ascendant. Because I think that's what was originally meant. Zero degrees of the eighth sign of the ascendant. Because basically what you're doing is finding out how far the ruler of the eighth, hold it, not the ruler of the eighth, sorry, never mind. Uh, finding how far the moon is from the eighth house cusp and then projecting that from Saturn. 
But I, so I think zero degrees of gate sign is probably the correct one to use. But that in itself doesn't tell anything about depth, that it's in the eight thousand degrees. I think I can say it means you're going to die. But this is not news. <laughs> you don't change it for day or night. If I don't give you two formulas, there is only one formula. Okay, another question. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's not the regular seventh, but the seventh from a lot of marriage. I'll get that back here. First of all, it only pertains to the Venus Jupiter lot of marriage. Or I won't say only, but that's what they were aiming at. If the Lord of the lot of marriage should be found in the seventh house from the lot of marriage. That's an indication of adultery. Uh, it's probably also true that the Lord of the seventh house in the house of marriage, in the lot of marriage, would also be indicative of adultery. But it might be a matter of which one commits it. At any rate, the seventh house from that lot of marriage is a place of adultery. Yes? Yesterday you told us that you were going to talk about the four parts of the life. Yeah, um, and I also said yesterday that I didn't know how many topics I was going to get to discuss. Yes, I know. Yeah, so that's not going to happen. No? Okay. It, because it would take me a couple of hours to do it. Yeah. At a table. So that's something we'll have to do next time. Yes? There is also a question about yesterday. You said about the de degrees the planets are in exaltation. You, you, you put here an specific degree. Yes. You said you were going to say why. Okay, sure. Um, I really did that? <laughs> <laughs> there are a couple of calculations that involve the actual degree. In fact, one of them is a lot. There's a lot called the lot of exaltation. And it seems to be basically a lot of just real good things. It helps you, it, it helps exalt whatever house it falls into. And its formula involves two of the lot, two of the exaltation degrees. By day, the lot of exaltation is ascendant plus 1900 Aries minus the sun. See, that's the sun's exaltation degree, 1900 Aries. And by night, would you care to guess? If it's an exaltation of the sun by day, what's it going to be by night? Exactly. So the night formula is ascendant plus three Taurus minus the moon. And Valence seems to think it's very important, and I haven't really experienced it one way or another. Um, there are also some predictive techniques hinted at in Valence that involve the actual exaltation degrees. You now know everything we know about the exaltation degrees. They are, however, enormously mysterious you have no idea how much ink has been spilled on the subject of where they came from. The whole Western sidereal movement has its origin in the attempt to find where these degrees came from. Cyril Fagan, who was the founder of the Western sidereal movement, concluded that the exaltation degrees arose as the result of the positions occupied by each planet during a year in the 8th century BC when these planets emerged from the sun's rays. 
the reason he supposed for this year being significant was that the Assyrians built a new temple to the god of astrology, Mercury. Nebo, Babylonian. Interestingly enough, in the year in question, the planets did all appear in those degrees. But only if you use a sidereal zodiac. So he concluded, the exaltations are valid only in the sidereal zodiac. There is only one problem with this thesis. There is no Babylonian evidence for these degrees. They do not appear until the Greeks. So it's an interesting thesis, but it's got serious problems. I can tell you from my own experience that the exaltation signs seem to work quite well with the tropical zodiac, the one you would normally use. Um, so at the moment, I have to say that Fagan's argument is historically interesting, but uncompelling. Um, for all practical purposes, you can ignore these degrees. In Hindu astrology, there is a planetary strength calculation based on these degrees, but that I would not use in the Western system. We have time for a couple more. Do I see brains on the floor ready to be scraped off? <laughs> yes. When are you coming back to Mexico? Uh, see Luis. <laughs> uh, let me make a few co concluding comments about the material that you've heard this weekend. I do not reasonably expect you to go out of here knowing how to do all of this. If you've got something out of it, that's good. If you've got nothing out of it, that's not so good. If you are only baffled, that's not so good. But I would like you to at least have gotten this. This stuff is very powerful. In fact, this stuff is so good that astrology is about to become dangerous. Think about it. How much real injury can you inflict in contemporary astrology? You can inflict injury upon a client through your own stupidity, but I doubt the astrology will have much to do with it. Although people do, even now, do things like forecasting people's deaths and giving people the creeps. And generally speaking, that's why we don't suggest that people do that. But this astrology is so much more powerful that in the hands of unscrupulous people, it could really be dangerous. <coughs> Let me give you a little sample. Supposing that we got very good at calculating life expectancies. Now forget about the ethics of calculating people's deaths and scaring them. What about life insurance policies? The life insurance company, you're taking out a $100,000 policy. And the life insurance company says, what is your birth date? <laughs> and they conclude that unbeknownst to you, you're going to die in two years. <laughs> they turn down the policy. On the other hand, they say, we'll be happy to take your $100,000 policy because we've computed you're going to live to 110. <laughs> See the problem? This isn't possible yet, but we're getting close, maybe. Supposing, oops, that's fine. Supposing, oh, the way it died, the my computer, because the computer's radiate FM. This is an FM, and this is an FM microphone. Supposing for a moment that the government calculated the chart of every newborn child and found all the potential revolutionaries and rounded them up. This you could almost do now. See the problem? There's a real, there's a real degree to which we're better off 
Not having people believe that we know what we're doing. Because when people begin to realize that we do, we become either profitable or threatened. So traditional astrology is a great thing, but it does raise some interesting problems. For the moment, we're safe. Everybody thinks we're completely crazy. <laughs> Think of how liberating that is. As long as you don't mind being considered crazy. Now, my practice always is to give people clear evidence that I'm intelligent, that I tell them that I do astrology. And I always get people, how can somebody as intelligent as you believe in that stuff, right? Okay, so. <laughs> The real thing I want you to get out of the last two days is that we are on the edge of an astrological revolution. It should not be regarded as threatening even if you don't decide to study it. But if you do decide to study it, I think a long and rewarding study is open before you. And I invite you to join us. And I will conclude by putting Project Hindsight's address back up there. That's how you join us. <laughs>